Hello everybody and welcome back. We're continuing our Diviner campaign, this time doing scenario 6. That's our second scenario of the day, stepping up the difficulty to plus 3. Alright, I've actually set everything up while eating. I've already added the curses to this deck and this deck. Shuffle that deck as well, doesn't have any curses since the Diviner foresaw this and decided to avoid them. So we can start in any of these five hexes. Uh, first, we do need to do, oops, not that one. This one, we need to do road and city event. City event first. I think we may have some shopping. So first we'll do a city event. Um, yeah. Oh, rough. Wow, that's really unfortunate. I mean, I guess yes and no, but it is. All right. I didn't actually remember that that would do that. So we actually lost a check mark on everyone. So fortunately, there are two people who can't lose check marks right now, but the Diviner still does, which sucks because I was looking forward to getting another perk after the next scenario. But we gained a reputation and a prosperity. Both these things are pretty good. There's actually one prosperity from two now, which is nice. All right. And then we need to consider some shopping. This poison dagger is just so bad. Hmm. Just no, no weapons that are worthwhile. I guess, yeah, no, I can just wait till Prosperity 2. There's only one weapon then. I use a shield, really? No, I don't think so. Hmm. Yeah, the problem, there's a, there's a lot of issues with this. Um. All right, there are some classes that can use this to some reasonable degree, but basically, right. <clears throat> so for example, the Mind Thief takes this dagger. Mind Thief makes an attack on something for four or five damage, adds poison after that. The enemy has already lost a third, a half of its health with our first attack. So the poison is essentially going to probably add one more damage on our next attack. And again, this is something we have to use an item for and spend money for. And again, we don't necessarily long rest that frequently to begin with when we're playing on higher difficulty. It's much more difficult to justify long rests because enemies deal so much more damage. Obviously, if we can out of combat, we certainly do. But the biggest problem is, again, just that it applies poison after we attack. We attack for big singular amounts. Um, yes, poison does scale well on higher difficulty. I, I'm not disagreeing. Like... I think that abilities which make small damage attacks and add poison to multiple different enemies are very, very strong. But making a high damage attack which adds poison just defeats the purpose of adding poison. Poison is good when you can do it to multiple targets for small amounts or you can do it on like a secondary action. For example, the scoundrel's move three poison affect an adjacent enemy is very effective, right? Because it puts poison before the scoundrel attacks, which makes it good. Putting poison after big attacks just isn't good. It loses a lot of the the purpose, the thing that makes poison good. And again, that's the only way we apply it here. We don't have small attacks. At level 3, we could theoretically have Brain Leech, which would be when we could consider it again. But for now, at least we don't have Brain Leech. And usually we don't really want to take Brain Leech at 3. It's pretty mediocre. So again, <clears throat> not good. Um, here, we can actually buy the Piercing Bow now. Might as well. on the 14 gold. There's no other weapons that the Cragheart will want to use anytime soon. Not until we get to Prosperity 4, so this is kind of just, why not? Again, chest, we're going to hold out, I think, for Prosperity 2. The Warhammer. Yeah. The Warhammer isn't really good until we get to level 6, I guess. Um, so, yeah. I think the Piercing Bow is probably just going to generally be better. Yeah, I mean, again, there, there is unstable off people Warhammer, but the, see, the nice thing about Warhammer is that when you're having a difficult fight, you can choose to use the Warhammer to kind of, like, win the fight, right? Um, again, I don't think Warhammer is even a very good item, although obviously there are some classes that break it. Um, but the problem is, as the Kragart, you don't want to lose. I mean, like, doing an attack three loss sucks. Like, it, it's really bad as the Kragart. Um... Stunning a bunch of enemies does make it good, 
But again, then we have to deal with the fact that we no longer have unstable upheaval for the rest of the scenario. So we've gone from having 13 initiative to having like 28 or 29 initiative, which is an atrocious difference. Um, so yeah, at some point, maybe that could be a consideration, but certainly not. Well, again, our second best initiative is 28. So Pearson Bow just makes more sense. Over here, uh, boots at prosperity two are probably more reasonable. Certainly don't want jump boots. We already have chest. We have small item. There aren't really weapons for us. Piercing bow would definitely be silly. We could go ahead and buy eagle eye goggles. Ugh, we really don't attack that much, nor that many targets for now. Yeah, we, I mean, I'm not disagreeing that the effect is powerful. I'm just saying that I don't think it's, I just don't think it's worth losing in stable upheaval. I think the initiative is too important. Even if it's, I mean, like, again, if we compare this to some, what some other classes can do for AOECC, which doesn't involve losses or involves losses, but at much lower cost, eh, just don't think that's our strong suit. Better to have unstable off people and be able to repeatedly play rock slide before enemies move rather than after enemies move. If we lose and save off people, we can no longer rock slide, and rock slide is just our best action. Pre 9, so it's just more important that rock slide always goes when we want it to go. Uh, so Eagle Eye Goggles. It's just, I mean, later on they could be useful. There's just no other. I mean, at Prosperity 2, there's no Helm we're going to use, but is it worth even spending the money on this? It's so much money for so little effect. We don't even have another spent item, so we're not even heavily incentivized to long rest. We have a small hand size, so there's some natural incentive to long rest, but... Eh, no, I don't think so. Okay. So we just need to make our card swaps. Hmm. Avalanche mostly sucks, but maybe it's decent in this room? Can we make it decent? What if we're like here? We put obstacle here and here. This does something. I'm not sure how much it actually does. So then the diviner has to like run into the corner. Mind Thief also has to run. Unless we put here and here, but now that's not so good. It's better here and here. I mean, this does delay them for a long time. Lots us to fight in a more confined spot. It's probably not bad. It's probably better than something else we could have. Mm, most of our other cards aren't bad either. I guess at that point it's like opposing strike. Ah, it hurts to lose opposing strike simply because that in, um, that experience is so nice. We need to get level four, but yeah, that's probably correct. All right. Um, So important for initiative, probably just this card. God, I really like these, but I mean, something's got to go. It's probably the worst card in our deck. <clears throat> I guess I wonder how useful this actually is here. Would be a fair concern as well. The heal isn't so necessary because the card is still bringing a lot of healing. The move to attack to is actually bad against all the enemies in this scenario. This is kind of better healing than this, maybe. I mean, it's kind of similar. This one at least we can use while moving, which is nice from room to room, which is when healing's best. Mm. No, no, it's tough. It's certainly one of these two cards. Attack 2 is just so bad against things with one shield or two shield. And the range is also pretty limiting. Also, yeah, I guess it kind of makes sense to bring this in for this, simply because, I mean, we're bringing, like, this is an only bottom, so, and this is something we're primarily using for a bottom, at least in combat. Um, so yeah, I think that's a reasonable cut. How about over here? 
So the elite corpses do poison now. So submissive affliction bottom adding poison is nice. The invis can also be good here, especially if we're still using obstacles. I mean, it's I think this as well. We're not gonna have a lot of movement. This is our worst card. It's definitely, it's always one of these three. These are all like kind of medium cards. Hmm. I think we need the one additional move four. I think once once we get our move five at next level, then we can change, but oops. We made a mistake there. Uh, let's go with the other one as well. Okay. This is really, uh, yeah, this also sucks. It's the same reason. Too many enemies have shield one or higher, so the damage is pretty insignificant. It does add poison with the corpses, but this is so narrow. Alright, so... Same turn we have to do when we've got to do it. We're bringing uh, Avalanche for this. We're going to use it. Where are you? The Avalanche, you do it. So everyone needs to move out of here before 13. Woof. Alright. Um... Unfortunately, the the disarm rift doesn't quite work here. There's nowhere we because we can place it here. I mean, theoretically, we're both moving to here and here. So no matter where we because we have to run because yeah, we need to place the obstacles here and here. What if we started here and place the obstacles here and here instead? Is that better for us? I don't think it changes much. I guess it removes one person who has to move. Which then does do some things, maybe? God, the annoying thing here is the 21. God, 21 is so annoying against skeletons, huh? So there's one card in their deck where we can get punished. Otherwise, this does allow us to disarm both of them. So only the mind thief needs to move. Oh, never mind. If the mind thief uses no, but mind thief probably wants to set up the mind's weakness, huh? In which case, hmm. no, no, because we need yeah obstacles have to be there. We need to go before 13 now and move. That's literally this or this, and I don't want to use this. That's actually really good here. It sucks to lose the heal as well, but this works. So if we go to here, then what are we doing? We're placing the pulley rift here, I guess. Placing the other rift here. No, because if we. That doesn't work. Placing the pulley rift here. We actually don't get... Well, we do. Placing the So we place the regular rift. Oh, no, it's got to be unoccupied, though. Oh, that's annoying. How important is it for us to get an attack through with the Mind Thief? It's not really that important. Every bit of damage does help against them. That's just our positioning here is annoying. Because we can put the pulley rift here. Problem is, if we, we can't place the Disarming Rift here. The Mind Thief is going to be here to attack, which means that it, Mind Thief can get attacked from any of these spots. So we can always disarm the one we pull, but then the other Rift we place, this one's just going to move up to here. And if we pull this one, this one's already next to to attack. So I don't believe there's any way we can actually get Disarm and pull. That's unfortunate. Because 
otherwise the the other disarm effect won't be up first. All right, so this actually doesn't work so well here. Unless we go before the Mind Thief, but this doesn't work with these initiatives. This just doesn't line up. Hmm. All right, so what if we don't attack with the Mind Thief? Then we don't really need to do the Pulley Rift either. Then we can just set the, no, we do because we need to move this one out of the way. Unless the Mind Thief like runs to here. Then we place the Rift here. Yeah, then this works. I can't do the Mind Thief late because I need the Mind Thief to be gone from this spot so that the Kragar can place the two obstacles here, which creates the wall, which is pretty important. Otherwise, because the issue is I can't have the Kragar go too late because the corpses can actually move at 21. So I need to have the Kragar go before 21 and place the two obstacles. All right, so if the Mind Thief just doesn't attack with Mind's Weakness, that's probably worth it. So then the Mind Thief just like moves to here. We really need the Mind Thief to move to here, though, right? If Mind Thief moves to here, yeah, then we can't... Well, I guess then we can place the two rifts. Well, that's fine. And we just don't have to pull. And then they'll walk into the rifts and disarm both of themselves. Unless they go at 20, which really sucks for us. Otherwise, if the Mind Thief does move to here, but again, that's just not possible. It's not possible to set up the Mind's Weakness and move to there. I guess, well, it is if we use Boots of Striding. We could theoretically use our Boots of Striding. It wouldn't be the worst thing ever. Then we can place the rift here. No, because this one will still just go to here. No, it won't, because it won't hit multiple targets. So if we place the rift here, this one with it depends how much movement they have. The four, so even at minus one, it'll go one, two, three to here. And then this one, no, then this one will just go to here. Yeah, okay, that doesn't work. So we can actually place the two rifts though. This gets us guaranteed disarm both of them. Assuming they move. That's probably fine. All right, so be it. I mean, <clears throat> getting two-term disarm on the two most dangerous enemies in the room is uh, certainly valuable enough to, I think, just like kind of waste this action. Not waste it, but use it essentially just to place another rift. Sometimes that's the value, right? And then the Mind Thief doesn't need to use boots, can just go to there. I'm not doing anything very exciting. All right, here we go. Good. Uh, and the, surely enough, the 21. All right, I'm super happy with my decision-making. So we're going to use the bottom of Empathetic Assault to move to here. And then we're going to use the top of Mind's Weakness, gain one experience, and activate it, attacking nothing. Gragart's turn. We're going to use the top of Unstable Upheaval as a default top. We're going to use an Endurance Potion Charge to bring it back. Then we're going to use the bottom of Avalanche, creating some obstacles. Obstacles go there and there. Okay, then it is the Diviner's turn. We're going to drop some rifts. So, yeah, it always has to be here and here. All right, so this one will go there or there first. I mean, we could pull one into one if we wanted. There's an interesting... I mean, right. So, theoretically, we should not use the pull. What we could do is we could actually place a rift here and pull one into it. Which would then also, like, so we could do the first one here, or first one here, or whatever, and then place the pull one here, and then, like, pull this into it, because then this one will move in. So the advantage of this is that means this corpse won't actually make it to the Kraker at this turn, because that spot will be blocked, um, which is, he's currently going to immobilize and muddle the Kraker. I don't know how much I actually care about that immobilized model, though. Um, I guess there is something to be said for that. The downside is then this won't be disarmed anymore. It'll only be disarmed for this turn rather than two-turn disarm. And the two-turn disarm is just so much better. I don't really care that much if this... I mean, I guess the thing does hit for four. Being next to me and me being immobilized is maybe not the best thing ever. You can also just push it away next turn with duality shards, though. Using the top, which is actually fine to do, I think. Do, like, the bottom here. 39. Uh, they could do the 32, which is their big attack without moving. That would be really unfortunate but I think now I think this I think it's better to get the two turn disarm on the skeletons which again are the most threatening enemies in the room for the time being at least all right so again we just use the top of uh, void snare to place a rift at range three and the bottom of revitalizing font to place a rift at range three place the rifts there and there we won't do any pulling towards them and any enemies that walk into the rifts gain disarm okay living corpse up so plus one move 
One, two, three. One, two. One, two, three. I'm pretty sure the regular has the same movement. Yes. And this does indeed immobilize and muddle the cry cart. Which is kind of annoying given the number of curses in our deck. And letting bones go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we are quickly surrounded. At least two of the enemies which are occupying sp spots next to us are disarmed for not just this round, but also for next round. All right. Uh, so I guess since actually these move so much, pushing us away doesn't accomplish much unless they get minus one movement or don't move. But again, their don't move at this point would be 32, which would beat what we want to do here. We don't need to use the shielding this turn because the skeletons aren't attacking. Much better to save that for when they will attack. We do have earth, but we're also muddled, which makes this suck a bit. Hit all of these, but they're also not the most important things to hit. Yeah, rumbling advanced bottom actually sucks. Does as much damage to our team as the enemy team here. All right. Let's see what the rest of our party is up to. So the mind thief is already adjacent to one of these. So what we actually really want to do is to stun late. Uh, me? No, I don't believe that'll be possible. I mean, theoretically, if I get through this scenario really quickly. But yeah, exactly. The days that I stream are pretty difficult to do stuff like that, simply because, I mean, I get back, so I stream starting at 4. Unless that's the purpose of the stream for the day. But no, at this point, I already think I already started a second scenario. I don't believe it's possible. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. It's just, again, just something I can do today. All right, anywho, we want to go after the skeletons. Hopefully 79 is going to be late enough. We're just going to use this as default attack, and then we're going to stun one of them with Perus Edge. This will set up the ice so that we can stun the other one. So we stun one with Perus Edge, and, well, maybe attack the same one, maybe attack another. The point is we just want to go as late as possible so that their disarms wear off, so that the stun comes after, so they'll be stunned for the following round. I guess otherwise we could go early and then just stun the corpse. That would let us do a better attack, although we don't really have better attacks than attack fours here. I mean, we have Bridge Apparition, but we want to use that next turn anyway. So that wouldn't really change too much, I think. Yeah. All right. Oh, man, that muddle really sucks, but I think Dirt Tornado plus um, Heating Swing is still correct. All right, so what are we up to? It's also true that we could actually just use this on the corpse there. We'd have to go after 57, though. Hmm, this would prevent a pretty big attack. I'm not that afraid of that one attack, I think. Also not sure how much I want to use this bottom rather than the top, so to say. I think I always want to use this, no matter what, to give two free curses. But then the question is just, what am I doing on top? I guess, actually, I can just use this on... No, because moving this away doesn't do what I want because it opens the spot. Hmm. Hmm. And I can't go after the cry cart with 57, so it doesn't work. Because otherwise the cry cart doesn't hit that one, and that would be a shame because then there's no way to hit three. And I sh certainly should hit three. I'll wait a turn to use the stun, I think. So in that case, I guess I'm just going to use this top attack. Even if I'm not necessarily pushing, it's still just an attack three while giving two curses on the bottom. I think overall this is pretty good. All right, let's go. Well, they're not attacking anyway, so that's fine. These are, but that also works fine. Okay, this is pretty decent. 
All right. So the living bones go now. They're already adjacent to their targets. They just lose their disarms. I guess I could have gone and stunned one of those with her as well. Hmm. I mean, I can do that next turn, so it's not the end of the world. But that maybe should have been a consideration. I wasn't thinking about that. All right, so let's make an attack three, range two, push one. Don't believe there's any reason to use the push here. I'd rather keep the regular next to us rather than the elites. And uh, I'll just attack the regular. Um, my low damage attacks aren't so valuable on things with one shield. I'd rather do it to something with no shield, even though... I mean, now that this is next to us, it's kind of similar danger. These are still more dangerous, but I can CC these pretty easily. So let's make an attack three, targeting living corpse number one. The top there, so plus one, nice. So four, down to seven. And again, not using the push, but we do create light. And then oh, we also create dark, doing curse, range three, target two. Doesn't really matter what we target, we just give the enemies two curses. Which is also nice. Okay, so then we're up on the cry heart. We're going to use the bottom heaving swing to add plus one to all our ranged attacks. Gain, uh, consume earth, gaining one experience. This gives us an attack three. Unfortunately, disadvantage. We're going to hit all the corpses, because if we were to hit the bones, we would have to also muddle the mind thief, which would suck a little bit. Um, because I mean, the mind thief's attacks actually matter. So we'll do one, two, three in that order. And these are unfortunately all muddled. Oh, that one's going to miss anyway. Next one. Okay, that one's fine. And no damage. Ouch. I mean, with that many misses, with two out of three misses, I would have really just hoped to at least have gotten two curses. So we do three damage here. That was pretty disastrous. And nothing else. I'm not going to bother placing the muddles. That was pretty disastrous. That muddle really hurt us. All right. So then it's the Mind Thief's turn. So we're going to use the top of Feedback Loop as a default attack for, mm, I guess, better to attack the one that can hit two things. Although it doesn't really change much, but yeah. We'll attack. No, because I guess that's the one we're going to stun. But actually, that also doesn't change anything. I don't know if you saw earlier, but I'd love to see you run a scenario with Diviner Cthulhu Sun for Maximum Comedy. Yeah, I'd be interested in doing that at some point. But that would kind of be something more that I would do on um, probably on Monday rather than this. This is kind of like my serious campaign day. But yeah, I can potentially do that this coming Monday. Take a day off to do that. But yeah, I mean, that would be the point, is the one Themris suggests there would be more than anything. But it's also like... I don't know. If you're running Cthulhu Note, you can't really lose to anything except very specific scenarios that you can't beat with that. So I don't know how adding the Diviner would actually really change anything. Anyway, we do our default attack here. So attack 4. Plus 1. So 5 has one shield, so it takes four down to seven. Ah, fair enough. And then we gain one experience. We make our disadvantaged attack, stun, targeting the same one again, because it's the one that can hit multiple targets, so it's more important to stun. Disadvantage, would love to see a curse here. Hmm. That's annoying. Because it wasn't doing damage, basically, anyway, so I'd rather just use this opportunity to draw a curse. Okay. I think people overrate that persistent loss on the diviner. Yeah. I mean, like, don't get me wrong, I think this party would be powerful, but I, like I said, I, I think... So the card everyone's talking about is this one. No. Oh, there we go. Uh, if an enemy draws a negative or miss attack modifier card during its attack, that enemy suffers one damage. It's like, not bad. I, I mean, alright, sir. It is a powerful effect, but again, I think people just underestimate the 9 card hand size thing. I think... Enemies have so much health. Alright, like... Like, yeah, I agree with Themris. I think it's quite, again, I, I think it's quite average. Like, this sort of effect is so powerful in the other instance in the game, similar to this, because you have so many more cards. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand the level 6 card to go with this. I would never do this combo, though, right? Because, again, then you're playing two losses in the beginning of a scenario. 
I actually did the math on the six. I think the six is interesting. Um, yeah, the other instance is so much better also because you have so many more cards, so you can afford to play the, the loss from the beginning. Here, playing the loss from the beginning has such a better, I mean, such a more real cost. Uh, yeah, yeah, so like I understand this also stacks the chances of doing that. But again, this is then two losses on a nine card class. Like I, I gave an example. I mean, I responded to this theory on Reddit a little bit ago. The Scoundrel can't even really justify playing Watch It Burn and Crippling Poison, even though that combo combo has insane effect. Now, admittedly, also the reason you do this, you can't do this is because you can't play Watch It Burn because you have to take Long Con at nine because Long Con is like one of the stupidest cards in the game. Okay, fair enough. But I mean... It's difficult to justify, like, Crippling Poison to begin with on the Scoundrel. It's, like, hard to use this because of how much it costs. And that effect is insane. Here, like, the effects are fine. Like, they're not bad effects. If I had 11 cards, would I play both these Persistent Losses? Yeah, absolutely. On 9 cards? <sighs> Again, depends a little bit, I suppose, on the scenario. But also, the biggest thing is, scenarios that are very short, typically a little extra damage here and there isn't changing much, or a little bit extra negative damage. Again, this obviously gets much better if you consider that enemies can, like, if they ever have better modifier decks, right? But with a stock modifier deck, the, the damage reduction of this is so small. Again, obviously considers this. Okay, so... Let's do it like this, right? Um, let me grab this out. Sorry, give me a second. Just loading something up quickly so we can have a look. All right. Hello everyone, this is the damage calculator I frequently use. All right, so let's see what an impact adding six minus ones into the enemy modifier deck has for the enemy damage. All right, so this is a standard modifier deck, which is what the enemies presumably use. Again, I'm discounting the possibility that enemies can have a better modifier deck. Again, I, I acknowledge that enfeebling hex certainly can be more interesting when enemies can have a better modifier deck. But with a stock modifier deck, this is what it looks like. All right. So normally we have 5 minus 1s, so let's change that value to 11 minus 1s, all right? So what our expected damage normally for an enemy was 4. What is our expected damage for an enemy with 6 minus 1s? 3.77. This means we have gained a damage reduction of 2.3, or sorry, 0. 0.23. Again, ignoring, like Themer said, the interaction with curses. So ignoring that entirely, we've gained a damage reduction of 0. 0.23 per enemy attack, Okay. So, how much would we need to heal to play a Persistent Loss preemptively in order to do it as a level 6 card on a 9 card class? Let's think. Maybe, I don't know. Honestly, if, if I was being realistic, ignoring all the shields and other stuff that helps with the minus 1... I mean, like, again, we're, we're just talking about flat numbers here, okay? So, again, ignoring curses and shields, sure. So, what? I mean, Themeris, what's a reasonable number? Like 12? Would 12 healing? Would you even use that? Yeah, I understand. As a level 6 card? If you had like a level 6 loss that healed for 12 on a 9 card class, I think I probably still don't even use that, but maybe I do. So, 12 divided by 0.23. This would take 52 enemy attacks. 52 enemy attacks. So what if it's 10? What if we what if we're even a little bit more realistic, right? 10 divided by 0. 0.23. 43.5 or 43.478, whatever. So already, even if we're just looking at a, to get 10 healing effectively from this card, we would have to suffer 43. Well, we've determined that a level one heal six loss is reasonable. Seven or eight is a bit high. Okay, agreed. Although we've also determined that we determined that on a 10 card class, right? Here we're talking about a nine card class. And nine the difference between the value of a loss on a nine and ten card class is enormous, right? So I would say that ten is still very like I would never play a ten heal on a ten nine card class, right? No ten heal loss. But alright, even just again, that's still even if we did say that ten was reasonable, that's still forty three enemy attacks. Forty three attacks. We don't take forty three attacks in a regular scenario. 
No way. I mean, again, maybe with like a very specific party composition that involves never CCing enemies and having like a big beefy frontliner who's just going to draw a bunch of attacks, then maybe, maybe we can do that. So again, I'm not discounting that this could potentially work in a very specific party composition designed around it, but the math does not support this being a reasonable loss. It is way too expensive with way too small of a hand size on a class that has otherwise good cards. Let's move this back. And in order to play it early enough for it to have a relatively reasonable effect, it costs us way too long, too much longevity. Again, it's just mathematically not correct to play this card, I think. This card is at least a little bit more interesting because the value of true damage is obviously much higher than the value of a small amount of healing. So the question is, uh, you cannot calculate flat damage averages with a diviner in play that can rearrange deck and stuff. I think you're way too conservative with lost cards. I mean, I think playing conservatively with lost cards is how you beat high level gloom. I mean, like high difficulty gloomhaven. Um, but two classes. So yeah, this one is. I agree. This one has some synergy between the curses. I agree. The other one doesn't. It actually has negative synergy with curses. Again, first of all, so let, let's consider that we actually have to manipulate the enemy deck rather than our deck for that even to be true. But, all right, so Marcel, this, this is something I've always been curious about. So I'll get back to that. I'll get back to the discussion with Emerson in a second. Why balance around normal difficulty rather than high difficulty? Because an experienced player could literally, like, you, you can pick on any class in the game. You can pick me any any combination of classes, and you can pick me any cards, like presuming level up and level one cards. You can pick me any of the cards you want, and I can beat basically any scenario in the game on normal difficulty, right? So there's no need to balance around normal difficulty because it's just, like, it's, it's extremely easy. So shouldn't, like, shouldn't you balance around, like, what's actually challenging? So that, that would be, like, a fundamental difference in principle that I would disagree with. Because that, that's something that I noticed. The game does appear to be balanced around normal difficulty. The losses in the game appear to be balanced around normal difficulty. But normal difficulty is not challenging. Again, in Forgotten Circles, apparently that's different, which is interesting. And I am looking to it. Th there are. I mean, like, yeah. All right. So, but... Uh... It, this is an interesting concept. So in like in competitive games, well, th this is too long of a discussion actually, but it, it's an interesting concept. Like I understand that, I mean like, yeah, I think it's like more of an experience thing, right? A lot of people do lose early in the game. It's kind of what Themers is saying. I don't know. It, it's a difficult concept or topic for me to go too far into, I think. I suppose I have to kind of dance around it because... I mean, how I feel about it is a little bit different. But it's like, I'm not a pro gamer, right? Like, I do this as a hobby. I, I enjoy playing games. I happen to enjoy Euro games. And I think I'm maybe a slightly above average gamer, but I'm not a pro gamer by any sense. Or, like, there are people who are better at Gloomhaven than me, for sure. So, like, I don't know. I, I don't think it's too difficult to make the game so easy that you can't really lose on normal difficulty. I think that comes pretty early on. I mean... Jessica, my fiance, is also like like me. I mean, we're not super serious, and we when we were playing on two player, we immediate. I mean, very early in our campaign, ended up on like plus one and then plus two because, again, in the very beginning, like the first couple scenarios in the game, we almost lost, almost lost. Um, so like I agree that in the beginning, we even me. Um, like I almost lost. Many times we lost a few times, etc. In the very beginning, again, because experience makes such an enormous difference in Gloomhaven. You come into Gloomhaven thinking you know how to do it, and you just don't, and then you just like have to learn how to do it by failing. So I think everyone loses in the beginning, but I don't think that's like a casual or pro gamer sort of thing. I think it's just experience versus inexperience thing. And I think it's more interesting. I think it's it would be better to have Gloomhaven have a a lower like difficulty curve where you start with the game being a bit easier and then this accounts for the fact that people are going to come in, like, or not easier, but whatever, like, a, as it is. But then you ramp up the difficulty to appropriate, like, to accommodate the fact that people get better at the game as the game progresses. To me, the biggest issue is that the difficulty remains pretty static, or a bit of variance, but, like, kind of maintains a sort of static line. 
for the most part. And again, apparently Forgotten Circles fixes that, which would make me super happy. I look forward to getting to play it. But So this means that in the beginning of the game, the game is very difficult for you when you don't really know what you're doing. And then you kind of learn what you're doing, and then the game doesn't become very difficult anymore because the difficulty assumes like the same level rather than scaling up as the game progresses. And unfortunately, it actually kind of takes the opposite direction, right? Because higher prosperity items, enhancements, stuff like this actually tend to make the game significantly easier. And at the same time, it becomes harder to actually increase the difficulty. Yeah, Themris actually kind of has a fair point eventually. But anyway, so back to the other thing about how... Like, I can also... All right. From... Yeah, yeah. And... Don't get me wrong, I, I also can understand why you wouldn't want to ramp up the difficulty, right? Sometimes this is something that's very frustrating in RPG or RPG-like games. It's nice to feel that you get stronger. It, it's a shame when you're like, you level up and you get new abilities, but then the monsters automatically come up to your level, like, you know, I mean, suddenly become stronger as well, Some, sometimes, because you, you lose a feeling of progress. But at the same time, I mean, for something to hold up and be challenging and interesting, it does kind of also need to do that. Yeah, I, I think Themris hits the nail on the head pretty well there. Anyway, so back to this point. Even though I understand that theoretically the Diviner can... I mean, again, may, maybe I'll be wrong. We'll see how much we end up doing it. But thus far from my very limited experience playing the Diviner, it doesn't seem very realistic that I'm going to manipulate the monster deck that much because manipulating my deck is so much more valuable. Or I mean, like manipulating an ally's deck is so much more valuable. And again, I underestimated how good manipulating an ally's deck is. So again, I, I can certainly be wrong about this in the future, but... Manipulating an ally's deck is so much more valuable in general from the very principle because, again, knowing the X amount of damage is going to kill this target means I don't get attacked by this target rather than manipulating the monster deck. Yeah, all right. I guess I guess that'll change. When, when we start to look at multiple decks, we'll see. So I, I guess I'll say that at, at first glance, I don't think I would ever, ever play this card. And again, as Themer said, even if with manipulation, these minus ones come up like 33% more often. So again, even if we go back to... Uh, this? And we assume, like I said, that they come up 33% more often, which is maybe even a reasonable or aggressive con assumption, considering that um, like the amount we can manipulate them and the number of cards in their deck. Again, if we divide this by 0.67... What the heck did we just do? Oh, no, we wanted to... I'm just an idiot. So, I mean, whatever. If we have 44 times 0.67, we're still looking at 30 enemy attacks, again, to even get to a heal 10. And again, I, I already said that I would never, ever play a loss for heal 10 on a 9-card class. Um, we're, realistically, I would want probably like 15 healing, maybe a little bit lower than that. And as you said, that that's also because, again, I'm very conservative with losses. But again, I, I do like believe that this is the correct way to play, the optimal way to play. The correct way to play is whatever's fun. Um, so, I mean, that's each their own. But again, I, I would argue that balance, well, to me, balance is more interesting around optimal play rather than correct, and then rather than like fun play. Um, and as Demris would be happy to point out again, to me, I, I really agree with um, Mark Rosewater's concept, which is that it's good if you can make the fun thing also the correct thing. All right, um, so we finished our turn here. We attacked, we stunned. Yeah, I, I've noticed that, but I mean, teach their own, I suppose. I think Isaac, well, I don't want to get into this too much. I, I mean, like, I, I respect Isaac immensely as a designer. I think he's an excellent designer. Um, I think, well, first of all, I think it's fair to say that Isaac is more of a designer than a developer, which isn't necessarily a problem. Some people are better at design, some people are better at developing. So I think Isaac is like a 10 out of 10 on design and then maybe not quite on developing. Um, the other thing is I think it's interesting, like there seem to be like two halves to Isaac almost, because Isaac, obviously he's like, really good at Terra Mystica, right? And so he's obviously like a really serious Euro gamer because Terra Mystica is a really Euro game and being like really good at it is like really Euro. Um, so it's interesting that he's like 
this would be like the kind of like optimization type gamer, which he appears to be when playing Euro games. And so obviously some of that like trickled into Gloomhaven, but at the same time, his Gloomhaven design, I mean, as he's even admitted himself and they ask me anything, many times when designing classes in Gloomhaven, he was more just like, what's an interesting concept? All right, let's make it happen, you know, which was more like a fun sort of not... I mean, not focusing on it the same sort of way. So it seems like he, he plays and designs, apparently, based on, um, to some extent, Founders of Gloomhaven, Euro games differently than he designs dungeon crawlers, even if there is a Euro aspect to his dungeon crawler. So I think that's interesting. I'd be interested to read that link at some point as well. All right, so we have the living corpses up now. They have plus one movement, which gives them three movement. Uh, well, this one's always staying here. We can just take care of this quickly. These are both going to lose one life as well. Mm. So what is the fastest fastest path here? It's got to be doing this, because then it's two, three, yeah. Because if it stays here, it's one, two, three, four, five. If it goes to here, then it's one, two, three to there. So it's always going to be at one, two, three. As for you, you're always moving there. Now well, this is more interesting, right? If you're here, it's one, two, three to there. If you're here, it's one, yeah. No, sorry, it's one, two, three, four to there, or one, two, yeah, no, it's the same thing. One, two, three, four, whereas if you stay here, it's one, two, three, four, five. All right, so to there. All right, um, so we don't have this anymore, and we don't have this anymore, which means we have some interesting stuff we can do. We do need to endurance potion at some point here. We'd like to, it's probably probably ideal to. Um, should certainly use this here, I think, to stun this bones down here. This bone is stunned. Let's see, what are we up to? Oh yeah, no, we actually, we get to stun one of these bones down here. And do what else? Oh, no, we actually wish we had some initial affliction. Ugh. Now, the initiative would suck, actually. No, because we want to go before 20. So, we actually... I'm not that sad. Immobilize can be good. Invisible can also be good. Do I, I don't have late initiative anymore for next turn, though, do I? Oh, no, I do. I still have Gnawing Horde. So, yeah, this actually works. Well, I don't actually need the Invisible this turn, though. It'd be better to have the Invisible next turn, I suppose, and go early next turn and do it. So that kind of means just playing this to throw away. I suppose that's fine, though. Then next turn we have Invisible plus, like, one of our top attacks. I guess the top attack could also be this. But if we're going Invisible, there's not much to be gained by mobilizing a target. Because there's only one enemy right now that'll be able to hit the Crackheart anyway. So mobilizing doesn't really do much. Yeah, and we need to go before... I mean, going before 20 is good going before 12 is ideal because then we stop even their like self-healing nonsense yeah which they haven't already drawn which is actually one out of six at this point um hmm none of these cards really do much as bottoms we don't need to teleport anywhere we're not playing any of these losses and the healing uh, isn't really where we need to be right now. Although maybe at late, the healing would be fine. I guess we're most likely endurance potioning something back. The question is, what are we stunning? I guess the advantage of going late is we could potentially just like stun this one after it, after it breaks the stun from the Mind Thief. And then we can still focus on this one because we, we also stun this one early. I guess it depends what the crack card is doing then, huh? So we don't have Earth anymore. We're not muddled anymore, which is nice. How is a massive boulder here? Wow, they're not quite clumped up yet enough for massive boulder to be excellent. Hmm. <laughs> don't have much better attacks though. We've got crater, massive boulder, and this is attacks. I kind of always end up having to use these. We're going to have kind of a healing turn at the end, probably with like this. All right. Uh, could just mess now if we want. Uh, well, in that case, we can actually just stun the, the adjacent one. Then we can just use early initiative. 
we actually need to go that early. So the earliest they can go is 32. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't change anything whether we do this or this. We're always just playing it for a default bottom and endurancing it back. I guess push isn't going to do anything anytime soon, so we could actually just use this attack now. And what for a bottom? We still don't need the healing. We don't really have any bottoms that do anything. Except for rumbling advance, which is not great in this spot, I think. Hmm. <laughs> kind of doesn't matter what we play then. Is there an initiative that matters? Not really either. I guess we go late. Maybe that is... Because these should move up. They should move to like this one to there and then this one to there. And then we can massive boulder this one in the center, assuming they move. Yeah, I guess that actually works. So we can play massive boulder. I guess then the bottom still doesn't matter. Suddenly just neither of these cards, pretty much. Also, having gotten the earth, sets us up to potentially do one of these things next turn. Uh, so I don't need early initiative, so I don't need to play either of these. I can basically play one of these. I guess it's this one. I'm not playing this anytime soon. I don't really care that much about having three movement. All right, here it goes. No extra movement. That's good to see. 81, yeah, everything works out here. Okay, so we're up first on the Diviner. We're going to begin by creating dark, gaining one experience, and stunning and invising the regular zombie there. Then we're up here. We're going to use the top of Frigid Apparition, consuming ice, gain one experience. Gives us an attack five stun, targeting living bones number 10. Yep. So five is four, so seven, then stunned. Then the corpses go. So number two, the spot that they focus is here. This one moves there, this one moves there, because they have only two movement, which means one movement is the most they can do in this spot. And they do nothing. This one loses its stun and invis. Living bones go, both lose their stuns. Yeah, we are out of CC now, so now we're actually gonna have to start killing these things. And then the Crycart goes. So the Crycart is going to use the top of Massive Boulder, creating Earth, making an attack three, range three, doing splash damage, targeting this one. Again, this one gives us the most splash damage and also doesn't hit the Mind Thief, which is not bad. Also doesn't have disadvantage or anything like that. So I think it's fine to just do this. Because these have three shield, attacking them for three is really only one more damage. So while these are kind of more important, honestly, they're not even that much more important to kill. Because once we kill these, these are going to move up anyway. So we kind of just need to kill everything. Um, so yeah, let's hit number two here with an attack three. Okay, plus one, so four. And then one splash damage everywhere. All right, so now we have Earth, so we can immobilize. Immobilize is actually not bad. Because if we immobilize this one, this one shouldn't reach us unless they get the plus one movement, which I think they're only plus one. They maybe have one plus one movement where they attack. I don't actually remember that well. But anyway, I think this makes sense. We'll see what else we do with that. Uh, so we wanted to go invisible now. because This blocks these off from attacking. And we certainly don't want to be pushing. We want to save our late initiative. Maybe the push would be useful. This is probably just going to be a default attack here. And that's fine. Oops, sorry. For us, I, I just got so distracted by other things. Obviously, like I said, we played this bottom just to be able to use Endurance Push and Charge and bring it back. Uh, so we don't really need the shielding here. At the same time, we don't have... don't really have much that does much, unfortunately. I was like, teleport one of these things away, which is kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, I guess that takes it out of the fight for a while. Again, we don't really have anything else to do... The shielding is going to be better. I mean, I guess the shielding is kind of equally good or bad this turn or next turn. Because the Crackguard is still going to get attacked by two things here, presumably. So, yeah, I guess we should just shield now. And then we can even stack the deck afterwards with this. Um, I guess I'd like to be able to stack the deck in early. So let's do this. 13 should be... I mean, 13 is earlier than any of these enemies can possibly attack. Teleporting away would have been fun. But maybe it's just less necessary. 
Okay. So what are we playing for a bottom here? So I'm not rumbling advance just quite yet. Don't want to use this because I kind of want that healing at some point. I don't need to go faster than 38. 38 actually works. But I want to also save this. So it's kind of free, just one of these two cards. This doesn't change much. Let's do this one, I guess. Okay, here goes. Oh, this. The healing? That's really annoying. That is really annoying. Because <sighs> it's so difficult to kill these things in the first place. Them healing for two is really painful. All right, let's use the top of uh, Protective Aura. All our allies get shield two within range two. We create light and gain one experience. And we're going to do nothing with the bottom of the world the journey. We don't really want to go anywhere. Okay. Then we're up. We're going to use the bottom of Into the Night, which makes us invisible. And we're going to use the top of Scurry. Doesn't change much which one. I guess it's better. If we do kill one, we'd rather kill this one. Because these things hit for much more than these do when they can only hit one target. So let's attack number 10 down here with the dot, top of Scurry as a default attack four. So just two damage. God, getting low damage on these is so brutal. All right, the bones go. They both heal for two. And three attacks the Cragheart. This is an attack for three. Plus one is four. We have two shield, so we take two. At least now our bottom heal will do something. Oh, except we played it as a top. Whoops. All right. So then we go. So we're going to use the top of Earth and Clod. We're going to consume Earth, gain one experience, and make an attack to range five and mobilize, targeting corpse number two. Oh, man. Rough. All right. That's that. And the corpses go. This one is immobilized, so it can't go anywhere and do anything. Actually... Mobilize wasn't necessary. That was stupid. I should have done default attack because then I could just heal myself. Default attacking this was just better. This wasn't moving anywhere anyway because we created the invisible. Ah, I was dumb. We should just use this to just punch like this corpse here and then use the bottom to heal ourselves for two, which would have just been better. All right. Uh, but this, the regular living corpse does attack the Cragheart. Doesn't poison, fortunately, and gets a minus one. So normally four, so three. We have one shield, so we take one. Or two shields, so we take one. All right, so again, we have our invis wall here, so we want to go late. We're going to do some deck stacking for someone. And... Oh, man. Short rest to get massive boulder back sooner is maybe a consideration here. I think we should probably do one more turn first. Is two damage to our allies worth two, da two damage? Is two damage to our enemies worth two damage to our allies? Probably not. I don't know if there's any downside to going early here. We're just tagging with this. All right. There it goes. Whew. Just barely. Who said five initiative couldn't make a difference? All right, so we're going to use the top of Peer into Battle, gain one experience, and do a little, little peek at the top five of someone's deck. It's got to be the Mind Thief, as usual. Okay. So the curse is unavoidable. We don't have any way of getting advantage, which is unfortunate. Soon enough, though. Soon enough, we'll have enhancements, and then we can dodge this issue. Well, I mean, whatever. Better to put this off as long as possible, I think. Oops. Looks like this. And as usual, we do nothing with the bottom. We're up at 13. We're going to use the top of Crater as an attack three range three. We're going to hit um, Corpse two. Skeleton 10. Corpse 2, I guess. No, Skeleton 10. More important to kill the Skeletons. Nice. So 4 is 3. And we're not going to do anything with the bottom. Alright. Corp. Oh. 
Actually, we are going to do something with the bottom. No, then this will let the elite get up here and attack the diviner. But otherwise, we're taking a big attack from this. Man. We messed up by not healing ourselves for two that other turn. This is going to hurt. It's a four and then a three. Four and a five. It's actually our health pool. If we move away, this doesn't hit, but the elite does hit the diviner. Now I kind of wish I'd attack this, but maybe that's okay. Then next turn I can be stunned. It still shouldn't kill the diviner. She has no cards in hand. If we get a, if we get plus one, oh, it's so bad. I forgot about this thing attacking for so much. I was just thinking, yeah, they're not doing anything, but no, they're not doing anything to the Divine Thief. They are doing something to the Cragheart. Yeah, yeah, all right. I'm gonna actually use the Bottom Unstable Off Evil to move to here then. Okay, so this way the Living Bones do nothing. Oh, well, the, sorry, the corpses go then. So this one moves to here and attacks the Diviner. Please be gentle. <sighs> well, that'll be the end of the scenario. Man, we have... Why can't we buy another Iron Helmet? If we could have three Iron Helmets, we would have one on the Diviner, no joke. Man, yeah, now we just lose. Uh, okay, so lose that. Who put curses in their deck? lose any of these cards. Losing this is so bad. Whatever. I mean, like I said, losing two cards like this on a, on nine card hand size class means that we probably don't be, make it to the end of the scenario. Ah, oh, that was so bad. It's just one attack we had to get a plus zero or lower, which is still favored. Yeah, certainly with the minus one already out. <sighs> All right. And so if we just actually played the Cragheart turn correctly before, we might have done this differently. I'm not actually sure, because that would have been really painful, because it would actually have been an attack seven or six from the Bones on the Cragheart because of the poison beforehand. All right, so the Bones do nothing. Mind Thief goes. I'm going to use the top of Fearsome Blade. I guess killing this one is not bad. Wait a second. I'm an idiot. We still get attacked. All right. I mean, it's for less because there's no poison and all that. So we take four. And I'm dirtling. I got too distracted. Hmm. So who do... I mean, we're always attacking with Fearsome Blade. The question is which thing we want to attack. Probably this. It's quite likely we kill. Oh, wait. We actually know. Oh, we have a plus one. So we're doing a five. Ah, I wish I'd put a plus zero on top. I should have paid more attention. Because now I'm going to overkill this by one. But this does eliminate an enemy, which I think is the most valuable thing to do. All right, sure. Let's attack that one. What a shame. We forgot battle goals. All right. Let's grab those. Take only short rests or maximum HP at the end, huh? I'd probably go with maximum HP at the end. That's much easier to do than never dropping below half. Loot no money tokens or loot a treasure. Well, we can... Two check marks is nice. I don't want to get no money. Loot a treasure. Kill three or fewer monsters, kill one or more elites. Much more likely to kill one or more elites. Well, we just killed one. I would take this no matter what, because three or fewer monsters is just impossible for the Mind Thief, who's our primary damage dealer. Or, I mean, our highest damage dealer in this party. And killing an elite, as usual, is quite easy, especially when we started in the first room with four elites. Yeah. Okay, uh, then we can move with Gnawing Horde if we want to. I don't think there's a huge advantage to this. 
Let me grab the coin. No, I don't think so. Okay. So short rest here. No mind's weakness back. Here. I don't even know. Yeah, short rest. We've got to get some effective cards back. All right. So level two Kara, but it's not by far not our least important card. Or it is far from our most important card. All right, sure. Mm. So now, do we need to long rest? Probably not right now. I think that's too painful. I don't want to lose my disarm combo. Which is, I think, what I'm going to do here. This allows me to place one disarm rift here, which should take care of this. And then... Oh, no, I don't need to place one over here. doesn't change too much either way. Just activating the rifts makes this one disarm rift. So I can actually just use a different bottom and just, yeah. Thirty is before they can attack, so I don't need better initiative. So I guess I can just use this as a free bottom. Just give them some free curses. All right. So us. So we don't actually need to go invisible, because this one. Wait. So then, should we not actually be stunning and visiting this one? Because then we can, st or stunning and visiting this one, because then we can stun that one. That actually, we're even. Oh, but then the disarm doesn't work down there. No, so that doesn't work. Gonna be immobilizing, for example, this, then we wouldn't have to disarm down here. But the problem with immobilizing this is quite simply that we're just doing so little damage when we do that. But maybe it's worth it then. So if we stun here, immobilize here, she stuns here, Gregor attacks there. We're doing some damage this turn, but not a ton. But then next turn we get a big attack with stun as well. Yeah, I think this actually plays fine. All right, so we don't need to do this, which I guess also gives us the upside of being able to do these two things together in the future. We do need to go earlier, though. We have weights in our bottom. We're just one range away. This doesn't actually work, though. I mean, ah, the corpse will go after 57, right? Right? <laughs> eh, we can hope. Okay. So, the usual massive boulder. Yeah, how about some bottom healing now? Some much needed bottom healing. All right, corpse aren't even attacking. Unnecessary in the end. All right. So, we go first. So we actually don't even need to immobilize this one anymore. We can, because then it makes the disarm rift do something in the future. But otherwise, we get to make a big attack. Regardless, we need to use the bottom of Perverse Edge, gaining one experience, always, and creating ice. And who, what are we stunning with that? So we're not really incentivized to stun the corpses at all, because they're actually damaging themselves and not attacking. So we kind of just want to stun this. And then we don't, yeah, and then we can just default attack top. Okay, so attacking the elite skeleton. I mean, this sucks because... Oh, God, I wish we had the curse here, huh? Man, we did not set up well for the future. Yeah, because the next time our big attack... So we could do two disadvantaged attacks to actually get rid of the curse here. It's actually probably worth it. That's kind of crazy. And it's kind of just stupid that we didn't... I mean, you really have to spend a lot of time thinking ahead when using this stuff. Like, when you have to deal with curses and things like that. Because if I could have had this this turn, it would. I mean, with this, it would have been so much better for me. But I actually still have a way around this. Because next turn, I'm going to make an attack 5 stun. 
And having a curse for that would be awful. I can, and this is always flipping two. So no matter what, minimum I'm flipping three modifiers here, which means the curse is on top. And I can't strengthen myself because I still haven't gotten to 50 gold to make that enhancement yet. So yeah, it makes sense to actually make two disadvantaged attacks. So first, actually, we're going to use Hostile Takeover. So we're actually going to gain two experience here because we use Perverse Edge and Hostile Takeover. So we're going to use Hostile Takeover, targeting this uh, elite corpse. So we flip two with a disadvantaged attack. We're doing this first because this way this actually does damage because that attacks here, doing two. Because the if we'd use that on the my, the one, well, technically then we get one damage. We get one more damage this way because now we're going to use Perverse Edge, which is going to be the one that gets a curse, targeting here, but that's okay. So then we use the bottom of Perverse Edge, Attacking the elite skeleton, we flip this and this, which gets rid of our curse. And stuns. All right, so we did it. So now we're up on the cry cart. So we're gonna use the top of massive boulder, making attack three range three. We're gonna target the skeleton or the corpse in the back so that we do splash damage to both of these. It just does the highest total amount of damage, which at this point is the most important thing. So targeting regular corpse number one. Okay. Three damage down to three. One damage here, down to four. One damage here, down to seven. And we created Earth, and then we're going to use the bottom of Earth and Claw to do a heal two on ourselves. We could use, remove the Diviner's Stun, I mean, remove Diviner's poison, poison, but I'd rather give us some more health so that we can actually take a hit in the future. All right, Bones goes, loses Stun. Then we go. We're going to use the bottom of Anticipate Intricacies, which gives them two curses. Then we're going to gain one experience and you do the top of dimensional transfer. We're going to be stunning you and visiting you so you don't have to deal with you next turn. Okay. Ah, but no, that doesn't do it for next turn. All right, so it's got to be you. That's fine, though. Because then we can use Frigid Apparition to stun you next turn. Okay, because you would just go right now and that would just skip this, which is not what we want. We actually want them to take the damage here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so Frigidist of Apparitions. We would like to go before 12, just basically with Empathetic Assault. That's fine. We don't. We shouldn't need the healing ourselves anytime soon. God, I miss having the attack already. Just have no attacks left, basically. So we're just going to be default punching you. Oh, so that means we're actually stunning you, because you should just maybe die or we just teleport you away um vidicent 11 says hey gripeway thanks for all the gloomhaven content i finished coming up with some cards for water-based brawler it is similar to cry cart in that it creates and consumes tiles water in this case i was worried it's too focused it's too focused on its theme do you think it's too much if they can create four to five tiles max per hand rotation probably tough for you to tell without seeing the whole picture but any insight would be appreciated four to five tiles is probably not too many per rotation the biggest issue with this is kind of like the the annoyance i guess it creates on the board um but no like i mean technically the cry can create five obstacles per rest cycle at level four with rock slide plus avalanche although you don't really want to use avalanche so more realistically it's three but uh, since they're water tiles, I assume it's difficult terrain, not even obstacles. And obviously, obstacles are more powerful than difficult terrain. So, I would say like creating five difficult terrain and three obstacles is a similar power level anyway. So I don't see that as necessarily being like I don't think it's a power level problem, which is again what I'm kind of best suited to deal with. Um, whether it's like a fiddliness hazard like annoyance problem maybe but again i would have to see how the class functions if you're consuming them a lot as well maybe it have it's less of an issue as well like i would just be worried about clogging the board more than the balance is basically my point okay so we attack and stun this one yeah exactly being annoying for allies would be my only concern we have Earth. We can hit a bunch of enemies here. It's probably worth doing. All right. 
So this works because we can actually do the dirt NATO plus. Uh, do I actually want to lose heating swing? Yeah, I mean not lose, but use. This is gonna muddle the mine thief, but I think that's okay. We're gonna get a lot of damage off of this, and also it kind of like gets us a guaranteed kill on this one, so to speak. Because now, if hopefully the diviner goes first, the diviner can hit this, and then we can hit. This. I mean, I guess not a guaranteed kill. Maybe we miss, but. If we see that it's going to go, uh, I guess 32 is the the point we have to be before. Yeah, this works actually because you can just pull it away with this. So if we see that this is going to go before, we can always just pull it away. Otherwise, we don't have to. We can pull something else or do some other things. Actually, even by like pulling this one to here after the Mind Thief hits it, we can make it so we don't have to muddle the Mind Thief. Yeah, this definitely this gives us a lot of flexibility. I have difficulty believing people don't want to take this. This bottom is great. And then if it's not going to go before 57, then we can still do this whole combo. We've got lots of options here. Lots of options. Called options the turn. 21, huh? We still go before that, so take that. Ooh. Oh, yeah, but you're stunned, skeleton. Perfect. Okay. So my thief's up first. We're going to use the top of Frigid Apparition. We're going to consume ice and gain one experience. This gives us an attack five stun targeting corpse number three. Plus one, nice. So we do six, putting it down to six, and stunning it. Okay. Then we do nothing with the bottom of empathetic assault. No. All right, bones goes, loses stun and invis. Then we're up on the diviner. Uh, So I've got a lot of options. I should start with just punching this one, though. Because I do kind of want one more damage to make it much more likely that the Krakart kills. Because as of right now, the Krakart has to get a plus zero or higher. If we punch it, the Krakart has to get a minus one or higher. And we do still have three minus ones in our deck. So this removes three possibilities for this not dying. Even if it gets its stupid turn off, it's not the end of the world. So yeah, let's start by using the top of Otherworldly Journey to just punch it. So attacking number two. Okay, well, that solves that problem. That was another way that this situation could be resolved, certainly. Okay, and so then what we're going to do is we're going to use the bottom of Revitalizing Font, place a Rift Token on an unoccupied hex within range 3, we're going to place this here, and then we get to pull this to here. That's to any Rift, right? Yeah, that's cool. Um, so we pull him to there. This is good because it's going to allow us to not have to muddle the Mind Thief and not be disadvantaged when we attack. All right, Living Corpses go. So this one's going to go to here. I guess the Mind Thief's getting muddled no matter what, though. Huh. No, that's not actually true. We can pull you to here. No, you're still getting muddled, and this would just go there. Yep. Nope, nope. It's got to be here. Yeah, because otherwise this just moves down to here. Okay, so this goes here, models, and immobilizes the Mind Thief, which is a bit annoying, but so be it. And then it's our turn, so we use the bottom of Heaving Swing, the top of Dirt Tornado, consuming dirt, consuming Earth, gaining one experience. This gives us an attack three muddle. We'll do uh, Corpse one, Corpse three, Skeleton three, in that order. So these are all attack three muddles. So three, four, and four. Not bad. So three here is dead. 4 here puts this down to 2, and 4 here is 3, down to 4. What a card. We don't have submissive afflictions, so I don't need to stack the conditions there anymore. Alright, so no matter what, we're playing these two cards, since we're definitely not resting early anytime soon on the Diviner. Um, we can visit at this point, and the Mind Thief doesn't do much. I guess it purports, prevents multi-target. I mean, anyway, we can just play this because the initiative is our best, and this is uh, If we go in Viz, we would like a late initiative next turn, but I'm not sure we won't want to have to go late next turn. I'd rather have the option to not go late next turn, so better to play like this. We're only missing out on the possibility of pushing, which does potentially do something, but I'm not sure how much it actually does. Well, it does some stuff. It does. As for us, we no longer have Earth. 
no longer have really any good attacks. It's got to be Crater and Upheaval for initiative. Okay. Oh, no itches. So the Diviner's up first. I'm just going to quickly blow my nose. Sorry. All right, back. Sorry about that. So there was... Wait. Was I supposed to have killed this? Yeah, this was supposed to be dead, right? This... Yeah, this was definitely supposed to be dead. I'm pretty sure I forgot to deal the damage to that because I knew it would die no matter what, and I just did the, the four and four here. I'm sure this... Because this, this did have two health. Because this was two health, the elite was three health. So I was always counting on this dying too. Yeah, okay. Uh, in that case... Yeah, the push would have been good because we could have done... Um, Immobilize at the bottom of Void's there, and then push with Fearsome Blade. It's just I thought there would be enough enemies that I would need to attack next turn. So this was a bit of a mistake. Oh, well, hopefully we should be okay. Uh, yeah, we can't really make it any better now. Well, we just need to hit to mess this thing up. We can loot coins. Yeah, we just have to be at 7 at the end. All right, so let's just do a default move on bottom. Move to here. And then a default top to make an attack two. Nice. So three, so two damage. Down to two. All right. And we're up on the crag heart. We're going to use the top of crater as an attack three, range three, targeting the bones. Because again, we just have to make sure the bone. Oh, no, because then we don't. Hmm. Do we count on the mind thief with muddle and two curses in deck being able to do a plus one or higher? If only there was some way to know. Because otherwise the Mind Thief does nothing for the turn. This only has two life. No, it's such an easy kill. I don't need to attack that. Yep, so we will use Crater targeting the Elite Skeleton. Okay. So it is dead. All right, then we go on the Mind Thief. Well, we don't do nothing. <laughs> I take that back. We're going to use the top of Into the Night to create dark and perform loot one. <laughs> Sorry, fellas. It's all I could do. All right, Living Bones has been eliminated. This was a tough room for us in the end. And the Living Corpse goes and loses its stun. All right, 100% long resting on the Diviner. Playing our two cards as early as, oops, as, early as possible on the Mind Thief. And us probably like to do some healing if we can here after the Mind Thief hopefully kills that thing. So something like this and this is fine. Okay, let's do it. So Mind Thief's up first. We're going to do the bottom of Gnawing Horde. Oops, we don't have these anymore. Moving to here. This way we can push this away. Worst case scenario, if we fail to kill it, it won't be able to reach us. We go here. It still won't be able to reach us, actually. And we're close to the door, so that's actually better. So we'll move there with the bottom of Gnawing Horde. Then we'll use the top of Fearsome Blade, gaining one experience. We'll make an attack four, push three. We will use the push just in the off chance that we fail to kill. All right, we did not fail to kill. That's good news. Okay, Kragart's up next. We'll just use the bottom of Avalanche as a default move two. Move to here. And use the top of Rumbling Advance to heal ourselves for four. And create Earth. All right, and that's the end of the round. Get our long rest here, which just removes the poison. Just choose card to lose. Yeah, it's fair. Yeah, the other one, the five that we could have done, whew. No joke. Yeah, it's also just, I mean, <laughs> playing against level 4 enemies with level 2 characters is pretty challenging, even for an advanced player, just because, I mean, all right, it's, it's quite challenging in first rooms like this especially, because typically what we do 
in order to beat like high level enemies is to prevent many of them from attacking by fighting them in narrow chokes and like CCing them, etc. But here, even with using the obstacles, it kind of just bought us time. It didn't really buy us a true choke, which wasn't quite possible for us to set up without having rock slide. Um, so we kind of ended up face to face with some you know, like really hard hitting monsters relative to our health and how much damage we could deal, uh, regardless. All right, uh, I think no matter what we're playing these two cards, should we short rest early here? I mean, the Diviner's thing, oh, so we still haven't decided the card to lose here. We don't have any elements that we want. Definitely want to keep these two. Definitely want to keep this. Probably need to keep the move four. Like my deck stacking. I'm going to lose the shield. And the shield is, it's actually really good in this room we're about to go to though. All right. Goodbye, deck stacking. Man, I'm going to miss that, but at some point, I guess it just becomes a luxury, huh? Okay. Uh, I think we're going to, again, try to draw the enemies up, so we do not mind having the Mind's Weakness here. I mean, getting putting the Mind's Weakness back up again and saving Endurance Post and Charge, I think that's reasonable. All right, so be it. It's not enhanced yet, so. All right. So our plan, again, is just going to be to draw the enemies up. So we're just going to do a little shieldy, and the other card doesn't matter much, I think. Because we're just going to Endurance Potion it back to get an extra turn. Us, I don't know exactly what we're doing, but we're kind of just waiting for enemies to come to us, so we'll just take the opportunity to heal ourselves for a little bit. And the Mind Thief. So the Mind Thief actually has to be the one to open the door. So the Diviner will move to here, so the Mind Thief can actually be on the door and tank. This way the damage is a little bit more split and the Kragarat's heal actually does something. It's not bad. So the Mind Thief doesn't need to use much movement to make it to the door. The Invis could actually be quite useful next turn. I guess we're not really going to be immobilizing anything in this room. Huh. All right. So we go first, where you do a move two at the bottom of Hostile Takeover. One onto the door. I always end up going down here. It's just because it's so much easier to fight behind these, the difficult terrain there. All right, so these traps are poison and damage. Nice. That's really good. All right, so we've got one elite and two regular skeletons. Huh. Oh, I was going to say perfect. Not quite, though. All right, what are these bones up to? That's fine. I'm not taking damage yet anyway, so I don't really care. And that reduces their movement, so that's pretty good for me. And then we've got three regular living spirits. Oh, yes, we're at the beautiful, the best level living spirit level. Nothing quite like the simple joy of the symmetry on that level card, or uh, unit card, unit sheet, monster sheet. There we go. Mm. I, I just take a minute to enjoy it every time I see it. All right, so what are you up to? Not even moving. Yeah, that's fine. Um, all right, so then we just activate the Mind's Weakness, gaining one experience. So we basically just got a free half of Endurance Potion there by bringing that back. Didn't cost us anything. Attacking them would have been bad anyway since they're healing themselves. All right, then we're up on the Diviner. So I planned on shielding, but I actually don't need to shield because nothing's even going to reach the Mind Thief. None of this other stuff really does anything either, but the bottom kind of does something because I can actually teleport onto this coin. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to make it there with default movement. So I'll use the teleporty thing like so. 
and then I'll just use the top of Protective Aura as a default top, and then Endurance Potion that back. Boom. Coined it. All right, so the Living Bones go. They have minus two movement, which means two for the Elite, one, two, and one for the regulars. <laughs> Creating a little triangle there, just so they can't be hit by massive boulders, huh? They've come prepared. All right, Living Spirits do nothing, because they're not in range to attack us, and they're not moving. Then the Cryheart goes. So we're going to use the bottom backup ammo to do a move three. So where do we want to be here? Now we'd love to have Earth next turn. Should we set up backup ammo here? Backup ammo will be really good against Living Spirits. Giving us a bunch of direct damage against them. Kind of. They're not quite clumped up the way we want yet. And these are also just like the things we have to deal with more than Living Spirits. I think I'm just going to go to here. I think doing a default attack too just kind of sucks. I'd rather heal my... I'd rather have one health than one damage on them, I think. Oh, but actually, backup ammo with piercing bow. Hmm. It's a shame to have to use the piercing bow before the last room, though. We'll see. I think I'd rather not use backup ammo. I think I'd rather just heal for one. All right. So short rest. Nope. <laughs> Not ever. Okay. That's fine. The only cards at level 1 I think you really care more about than Unstable Upheaval are Rumbling Advance and Massive Boulder. And in some cases, Dirt Tornado. Not really in this room. And that doesn't really change until you get to level 4 and you get Rock Slide, which is, again, your best card until level 9. All right. So what are we doing here? We can create some. Uh, I mean, we can't create some obstacles. It's not really great for us though. Kind of makes things annoying for the mine thief. If we go here with the mine thief, we can actually just execute one of these regulars. These traps do six damage. It would really be so much better to execute the elite. Not easily done, though. Hmm. hmm. Maybe. Now we're not close enough, unfortunately. Disarm Rift is really good here, though, unless they get their 20 again, in which case I'll be moderately unhappy. Okay, I think I can just do this like this. I don't know that we need to do the other Rift, but this allows us to set up a Rift Wall. We don't even need the Rift Wall because technically by placing, if the Crycart moves back, if we place a Rift here, both of them, like this one, we can move into there, and then this one goes next and walks through it to go to there if we choose, so they both get disarmed, which is great. Saving Protective Aura is also good for us. Even though it exposes us specifically to their 20, it's 1 out of 8 for the 20. And even then, there's only one actually attacking. And also, it's just having this... Like, this turn, it's pretty unlikely that the Spirits make it to us and hit us, but the next turn, it's quite likely. And against the Spirits, Protective Aura is quite good since they attack for 3. Blocks most of their damage. So accordingly, what we actually want to do is go late on the Mind Thief so that the skeletons move up and then we can stun one we can use perverse edge bottom without needing to move i mean like we can use this and still make a top attack all right so what are we up to we can sort of attack with anything i'd like to save massive boulder dirt tornado isn't very good I'd also like to save Crater. If I get Earth, I can potentially still throw one of these into this stuff. That's not, not so easy, but still. So maybe just Heaving Swing to attack? That makes Dirt Tornado a lot worse. We need to get out of here quickly, but that's fine. I don't know that the push is necessarily going to do something, but I don't really have better than an attack three here anyway, and I'm not sure I'm going to need the bottom of Heaving Swing anytime soon. Okay. They shouldn't reach anything, so that's okay. Okay. 
cards. So we're up first on the cry cards. We're going to use the top of Heaving Swing to make an attack three, targeting the living elite living bones. We're going to push him just because that value. All right, so be it. We do push him. And then we use the bottom of Let's Save Love Evil's default move two and move back to here. Mm, I guess our line of sight's better here, but as is the diviners, so. All right, and the diviner's up. Do I rather have two rifts or be up one more? Probably be up one more. I guess it doesn't change much. No, and actually that the further we are up, the better chance we get hit by a multi-target uh, living spirit nonsense. So let's just create a rift wall. It's also just cooler to create a rift wall. So rift rift. There and there. The bottom using revitalizing font. There's no point in pulling into... I mean, I guess we could pull one of these up. Actually, there is, yeah. So we'll... Wait, hold on. What's the range? It's range 3 from it, right? Yes, it is. Tar pull 2, target 1 enemy within range 3. Man, this just does so much. So we get to pull this to here, actually. The advantage of this being here is that we can actually target this one with massive boulder and splash onto these two, since these two are going to move up. If we don't pull this one up, these two will move up, and this one won't move because it can't find focus. So, yep, we'll pull you towards one of the rifts. We don't actually want to pull anything into the rift because it's better if they move into the rift on their turn. Okay. Oh, I'm an idiot, though. I don't need to stun them because they're going to be... Mm, I just, that was stupid. That was very stupid. Uh, I'm wasting Perverse Edge. My best card. All right. Living Spirits go. They're also creating ice for us, interestingly enough. And they have three movement. They have nothing within range three of them, so they do nothing. Requires less movement. All right, letting bones go. They go there and there, and they get some disarms. I guess I can stun the one in the back in case we kill one of these. But I suppose it does something. All right, we're gonna use the top of gnawing horde as a default attack. Uh, that's, I don't know. I guess better to try to kill some of them. The regulars only hit for one less than the elite, so. And they've already flipped their all target attacks on the same target, which is the scariest thing about the elite since it is three target. So sure, default top attack four, targeting number seven there. Oh, come on. All right, and then we use perverse edge on the non-disarmed skeleton. Yeah, of course my ordering was to blame and gain one experience and create ice, which is already created. Oops, we forgot to... Uh, we were always getting this back. This was the... We even mentioned this at the beginning. Just a lot of things we're trying to track, but we always bring in stable people back when we have an odd hand size. There we had an odd hand size, so we chose to bring it back. Not that it changes anything this turn. It's just I was like, why do I still have an odd hand size? I played in stable people last turn. And I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't get in stable people back. Um, I guess we can just heal ourselves with Earth and Claude here while attacking with Massive Boulder. We're just going to Massive Boulder this one. Sucks the massive bolt of these, but we do have to deal with these kind of before we can even deal with the the spirits. So for us, it's actually better to go. But what if they? Mm, hmm. The problem is the living spirits can consume the ice. It's one out of seven. Yeah, no, it's one out of six at this point. But they would consume the ice and do stun attacks. They don't move then. Yeah, so I guess it's fine. I guess we do this. Oh no, then they won't actually consume the ice because they won't attack. Because their stun attacks have them not moving, to the best of my knowledge. But we're not wrong. So in that case, they wouldn't even consume the ice. And even if they did, it wouldn't be such a big deal. The big deal would be obviously if they stunned us. But since they're out of range, that won't happen. Assuming the stun is without them moving, which I believe it is. And by going late, we wait until the disarm wears off, and then we can stun the elite skeleton, which is nice. Since we're going to attack with frigid apparition here, no matter what, I would say. Alright, I'm not doing it anyway. So we're up first here. We're going to use the top of Protective Aura, gaining one experience, and creating light. All allies within range 2 have shield 2. Then we have the bottom of Dimensional Transfer. Oops. 
In a fantasy setup mod, you can do revealed rooms also. Yeah, but like I said, revealed rooms gives information that you're not supposed to have as well, or not supposed to show. Like me, technically, like, all right, without looking at this, I know, well, I believe there's a pillar here and here. I actually don't know where the rubble is. The chest, I believe, is right here. I think there are coins here and here. So anyway, let's see, there was one rubble here. So yeah, there's going to be two rubble somewhere in the room. I actually don't remember where that's placed. I think there's like one down here somewhere, and then probably one kind of sort of symmetrical towards the top. Anyway, my point is, I like I know most of the maps almost by heart to the point where that doesn't change much for me, but just for the viewer so that they understand, like, so that it, I act as if, for the most part, I don't know what's in the room, and they don't see what's in the room. Like, this is how it's supposed to be done. Revealed, so revealed rooms isn't, again, quite correct because you shouldn't actually see what is in the rooms. What I want is, again, I can't, I mean, rules is written setup. Place all map tiles, doors, corridor tiles, objective markers, pressure plates, etc. Place nothing else except the first room. Hey, Keith. All right. Um, yeah, I think it's still probably not correct to move up so that we don't get hit by the multi-target although if they do multi-target they can still probably move up and hit us but i'm not sure maybe not actually right because they won't want disadvantage on their primary focus now so where we're standing here is actually good all right so we just use protective aura from where we are we do nothing with the bottom of dimensional transfer hmm. i was indeed all right these lose disarm. This, oh no, that heals them, doesn't it? Oh, but I guess I missed. <laughs> Joke's on them. All I flip are curses anyway. So they're healing themselves because they're disarmed, but that doesn't stop them from healing. All right, um, so then Living Spirits go. They have minus one move, minus one attack. This means two movement, and they attack at three range. So this one can attack from there. This one can't attack from there, doesn't move any further. This one can't attack, so it moves here. With one more movement, it can't get any closer to attacking either. Oh no, this one actually does move to here, yeah. So this one will get to move to there, because from here, it's actually two movement to get in range to attack. But from here, it's one movement to get in range to attack. Yeah. So that means this one over here. This is actually better for me. I'd rather than bump up like this. OK, so this one attacks the Mind Thief. Does muddle, which is a little bit annoying. Attacks for two. Ooh, OK. Fair enough. Well, that healing is going to serve some sort of a purpose here, since we don't have Empathetic Assault for healing anymore. Uh, so our two becomes a four, which means we take two damage because we have two shield. All right. For some reason, it drives people crazy that I, I use this version rather than the other version. Like, at least once per week, this gets brought up. I tested the other version, played it for a week, prefer this version, going to stick with this version. The other version fixes the problems that I have with it, agree to use the other version. When people ask what I'm playing on, I suggest you can do this one or the other one, which is even easier for beginners. But for some reason, people just keep coming back to this. All right. 
so we already got the muddle there. We took the damage. So we're up now on the crag heart. So we're going to use the top of massive boulder. Attack three, range three. Targeting this one because this does the maximum amount of splash damage. I would like to get some splash damage here, but unfortunately I just can't reach them. So on skeleton number 10, on attack three. Okay, that's good. So three is six, which is five. And then one splash on each of these. So we have to loot the treasure. We've already done kill elite. And we have to be at full health at the end. All right. And then we have the bottom of Earth and Clod as a heal two, range three, which we'll just use on the Mind Thief. Because she's missing two. We're missing one. Uh, Diviner is missing none. And the Mind Thief's in front at this point anyway. Okay. So then it's the Mind Thief's turn. Uh, so if I plan on going in Viz, how valuable is it to actually stun one of them? I mean, that doesn't matter. I'm going to do it no matter what. So let's consume the ice, gain one experience. We're going to make an attack five stun, targeting the elite. Unfortunately, with Muddle, so we already know how this is going to go. Oh, no. Okay. I'll take it. Wow. Something good to happen for once with modifiers. So a seven minus one, so six. Down to four. And stunned. All right, invis and attacking things. Us crater is pretty good here. So we can like double push one of these. We use the one push and then the other push to... Ah, uh, it doesn't actually work though, unless we attack first with the crater, which is impossible because we already played. Oh, no, we have unstable all people. Yes. Ah, uh, but then we don't get to go in Viz. But maybe that's okay. Maybe moving up. So we use crater to push to here. Ah, uh, but we have to push to here. That's annoying. We can't just push to here. And the mind thief can't easily attack there. Mm, okay. So that's a bit worse. So is it crater we want to attack with? Or is it better to just use Dirt Tornado at this point? Hit all of them. And then we can push one away afterwards. That seems fine. I mean, Dirt Tornado still does like kind of one damage to each. Which is still three total damage, but also muddles and lets us save our attack three for afterwards, which is, I think, just a little bit better. Like, Dirt Tornado is not getting any better than this, and Crater is always going to be approximately the same for us. And I guess that's not completely true. Dirt Tornado can actually do a lot of damage to these Living Spirits, but again, I'm really going to try to save my Piercing Bow until the next room. All right, and we're in a long rest with the Diviner, because she needs all the longevity she can get. Oh, God, the heals. Come on. Skeletons. They flip this so many times. All right, we're up first. We're going to consume Earth, gain one experience, make an attack two muddle, targeting all of these. We'll do six, seven, ten in that order. All these are attack twos. So two. Ooh, that's nice. Four, and no damage. Hmm. Uh, so two here is one. Four here is three. And none here is none. And then they're all muddled. And then with unstable all people, we're not going to do anything. Nothing to be gained. So then we go. We're going to use Fearsome Blade. We gain one experience. We make an attack four. There's no real reason not to push, I suppose. Attacking this one, this should be a kill normally. A plus zero would kill. So, yeah. Hey, Epsky, by the way. Uh, so we'll attack number seven here. Again, with Fearsome Blade. We're using the push, just in case. All right. Now we kill it anyway. And then we'll use the bottom of Into the Night to go invisible. Which just blocks the melee things from attacking us. All right. So this one loses its stun. This one can't move, but does, unfortunately, heal itself for two. Then the Living Spirits go. They're going to be making attack threes. Unfortunately, when we don't have the shielding up, so this one moves to here. Um, one, two, three. Yeah, this was here, right? So one, two, three. Or one, two, three. And this one, one, 
two, three to there. It doesn't get to attack. All right, so two and five both get to attack. We can attack threes on the Krager Art. All right, we've got a Helm, so we take three. Take two, so we take five total. Okay, and that's that. So we really need massive boulder back, huh? So very badly. Oh my god. Uh, well, we'll figure that out in a second. We get our long rest. Choose something to lose. So we have one, two, three, four turns left in this scenario. So the last room is just the Mind Thief and Kragarth, that's for sure. This is why you we cannot play losses. I mean, we're definitely short resting. We're not bringing back the mind's weakness. Yeah, that's unfortunate, but it's not one of our most important cards. It's a really difficult spot. I mean, I guess it should always just be this. It's a pretty easy choice to lose. So now, what we really have to decide here is for the crack heart whether the crack heart should get away or can get away with short resting early. I mean. We probably should short rest early. This is kind of what's crazy about how like losses work, right? Here, if we short rest early, we're playing essentially like half a loss, and the effect of our non-loss here is is like better than most of our losses. Uh, I mean, our level one losses at least. So I guess we stun something and attack. I mean, we're in Viz, so we could also go late, but the Living Spirits are going to cause some real problems if we go late. They have how much shield? Three shield. So even an attack five doesn't quite get them. Man, stacking our deck would be so valuable, but sadly we can't do that either. We could do double Rift turn or stun something turn. I guess we put like a Rift here, and uh, we can't put a Rift there. We do not have range. So that was an advantage. Now we still have no range. Um, so I guess it's like stun something turn. Yeah, we're going to short rest early here. Don't have enough attacks otherwise. All right, at this point, with a one out of four to lose massive boulder, we kind of have to just accept that unstable of evil's time has come. And we'll go with the best initiatives we can at this point. So what if we if we massive boulder here, this hits this, then we can rumbling advance up to here. We really want to rumbling advance into the center though. It's most important to hit these things. Massive boulder on this is three, but the mine thief can't really chip in additional damage to that. I mean can with hostile takeover, but it's pretty unimpressive additional damage. And also, unfortunately we just can't do any damage. Losing our attack early is painful. Ugh. I do st uh, like I, I enjoy this class a lot, but I do feel the lack of damage sometimes for sure. Like, I just need damage more than anything in this scenario, and I'm really, really struggling for a lack. I guess just shielding everyone is probably the best. In that case, is there any advantage to pulling? I can't really pull in a meaningful way. What I'd like to be able to do is to pull this to there, but it's one outside of range. I guess I should have moved up. Maybe. Oh well, yeah, let's do this. We'll keep this combo for next turn. So our earliest initiative is this. But this actually gives us some value since we don't need to move. The healing value is pretty nice here, so I think I'm going to take it. I don't know that 29 versus 38 makes a big difference against Living Spirits. So I can stun one of the Living Spirits, because why not? Unless they end up doing their ice nonsense. In which case, I guess I should just play this anyway. In case I have to go in Viz to prevent melee enemies from attacking. It's not like I'm going to need this again soon anyway. So this works. Ah, 22. That's annoying. 
Well, I guess we're gonna have the shield, so it'll be kind of alright. So we go first on the mine thief. So we are gonna end up stunning one. So we're just gonna use the top of into the night as a default attack. A four targeting the elite living bones. So we just need a plus zero or higher. That'll do it. I kind of wish we attacked a living spirit now, but so be it. Okay. And then we use the bottom of Perverse Edge, gain one experience, and create ice. And so the bones will move up and attack us, huh? At some point. But that's okay. Now it attacks a plus one, too. So I guess it's actually kind of more threatening than the spirits. The spirits are attacking for zero each, effectively, whereas the bones will effectively uh, essentially deal two damage. So I guess it is just better to stun the bones, because we're not going to stop the bones from... We could move here, we could do the stun invis on the bones. Uh, but that doesn't work because then we don't get to hit it with massive boulder, so that sucks. Massive boulder is very unlikely. We'd have to get a plus two or crit to kill. So yeah, all right. Let's 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 attack the bones with perverse edge bottom. Okay, that's not bad. So we do one damage. I guess that's the other upside is that we had a re somewhat of a chance of doing damage to it. Okay, so then we're going to use the top of Protective Aura, gain one experience, create light, shield two, affect all allies, and we're definitely moving up at this point, because next turn we're doing our double, double rift thing, so we would rather have more range. So let's move up using the bottom here, and all our allies within range two have shield two. Living spirits go, so all of them can attack the Mind Thief from where they are. Actually, this one needs to move away, so we can have it move to here, move to here. I guess here is better, because then after that, they're just like a bit more clumped. Sure. Move to there, and they all attack the Mind Thief for two. No damage, no damage, one damage, but that's okay. Because again, we had two shield. But the Mind Thief does get muddled, which is actually pretty annoying. Then it's the Krakart's turn, so we're going to use the top of Massive Boulder, making attack through range three splash damage, etc., targeting the Living Bones number 10. Nice. Well, we didn't need to stun him in the end, but so be it. It was the safe play, because our three does four, which kills him. We get one direct damage to each of the living spirits. So next turn, we want more than anything in the world to go very quickly, although we can't go that quickly, and use Rumbling Advance and move up to here to deal one more direct damage. We'll need to use our boots for that. We could move up here, but it's better just to use Earthen Claw to heal and use the boots next turn. So we'll then use the bottom of Earthen Claw to do a heal two on ourself. Living Bones has been eliminated. All right. So Rumbling Advance with 29 initiative. Top is just going to be kind of some junk no matter what. I guess Crater lets us get an experience. Better do that than to Dirt Tornado them just for two. All right. Um, Mind Thief can consume ice and attack and stun, presumably kill one of them. We also just want to go early here. I think 29 isn't early enough. Next turn, we won't be able to go very early then, but... Hopefully most of them should just be dead by then. Who knows? Or disarmed or something like that. I think the value of going earlier is higher this turn. Now nah, we would have gotten away with it, but that's okay. All right, so we go first. We're going to use the bottom of Hostile Takeover as a default move too. Better to go here than here, because here we get a coin. So we move to here, which gets us a coin. And then we're going to use the top of Frigid Apparition, Consuming Ice, gaining one experience. This gives us an attack of five. Unfortunately, we are muddled. Okay, that's perfect. So this does two damage because we have five. He has three shields, so he takes two, and he's dead. Also stunned, just for good measure. Okay, and then the Diviner is up. Uh, it's not that we can't move much, huh? Interesting. And we can disarm one of them, I suppose. No matter what. And just move up at the same time. Yeah. All right, so let's use the bottom of Revitalizing Font as a default move two. Then we're going to take one from... We're not... I guess we're going to long rest anyway, so we'll heal the one. Yep. So we'll do a default move two to here, which also gets this coin, which is not bad. And then we're going to use the top of Void Snare, creating a rift. 
technically here better because this one could also move through that. Actually, this one also will move through that if we have this one go here first. Yeah, all right, that works. Yeah, that's great. Oh, exploiting monster AI. And then we go on the Kragart. We're going to use the bottom rumbling advance plus boots of striding. So we get to move four. One, two, three to this coin. Does one direct damage to all allies and enemies. Oh, we had Crater as our attack. Sorry. First, we attack with Crater. Anyway, I mean, whatever we just did there is fine. I'm just going to do the rest of it. One damage here. And one damage here. So first, we attack with Crater. We're going to consume the Earth, gaining one experience and adding push two. We're not going to use the push, though. Uh, oh, no, we don't have range from where we are. Oh, that's annoying. We should actually use the other attack. All right, so we actually do have to go here first. We have to make a disadvantage attack? Rough. All right, uh, let's hit number five, I suppose. Well... It would have been better to use the attack three in the end of this. This was actually a mistake. I didn't realize that I wouldn't actually have range. I wanted to, I just, I was focused on using Crater this turn because I wanted to gain the one experience because experience is really important. Getting the Kragart to six or to four as quickly as possible is a really big deal. Um, but yeah, this was a bit stupid because we ended up, I mean, we didn't actually make our attack this turn worse, but we did actually make our attack next turn worse. Oh, well, living spirits go. So we get to choose how they move away to lose disadvantage. This one goes here, moves in, gets disarmed. And then this one needs to move too. So always to here, here. Can have it go like this, and then to here, and also disarm. All right, long rest on the Diviner. Some cards on the Mind Thief. It's okay that we're going late here because the monsters are both disarmed, unless they do their stupid cursing thing, which would be very bad for us. Can't actually even go earlier than that either. Um, better to save the multi-target heal, probably. Oh, I mean, I guess that's that's always the case. Better to save the bigger move for afterwards, I suppose. All right, here we go. Not the multi-target curse, that's good. So living spirits are disarmed. Like this, and like this. Lose the disarms. Both of them are done. Then it's the Krakart's turn, so we're going to use the top of Heaving Swing. There's not really any reason to push, I think. So we'll just attack, I guess, number five. That way the Mind Thief can move here and attack six. So we'll attack number five with our attack three. Ah, yeah, we got punished for doing stupid stuff. Okay. Well, so we don't kill it, and then we perform a default move two to here. So I guess it's the Mind Thief who's going to have to kill both of them. And we're just going to keep moving along. Keep on keeping on with the bottom of Avalanche. And the Mind Thief's up. We're going to use one of our cards, doesn't really matter which, to do a default or to do a move to there. And then we're gonna use the other one as a default attack two, which is really attack four, targeting number six here. Okay, that's good. Dead coin. Moving on. Alright, so us we get a long rest over here. Which heals us for one. We get to choose a card to lose. So I guess I need the biggest move no matter what, although it's unlikely to do anything. Probably these two are more likely to do something in general, although, again, I don't think we're ever doing anything again in this scenario. So should I give the Mind Thief a long rest and just have her stun here? No matter what, the Krakar's just moving and healing. No, I think I'll just short rest with the Mind Thief. Oh, but then I have to bring back... No, I can just use my Endurance Potion Charge here. I've still got two of them. Short rest. That's fine. I don't think we beat this scenario, but we're going to keep trying. There's a chance. There is a chance. Okay, so... Yeah, I mean, we certainly want to attack with Frigid Apparition because this is an attack 5, which means that even on a minus 1, we'll kill. And we're going to move with just one of these cards. Doesn't really matter. I guess this could be better if we ever make it to the next room here. All right, here goes. Oh, no, we're not long resting anymore. We are... I don't really know exactly what. I mean, I guess in case of a not kill, we just do like this plus this. Sure. All right, here it goes. I'm trying to use my ice. So my thief's up first. We're going to use the bottom first edge as default move two. We're going to move on to this coin, grabbing it, and we're going to use an endurance potion charge to get back for first edge. Then we're going to use the top of hostile takeover as an attack five, targeting this living spirit. Okay, so the living spirit's dead. All right, then the Diviner's up. 
Well, we can do this top, which gives us one experience and creates light, and we get to teleport four. Four to there. All right. Moving spirits been eliminated. So they do actually move when they stun. Oof, we did take a big risk earlier. Important to remember that. Then we use the top of Nature's Lift to do a heal two, targeting a bunch of things. Us and the Mind Thief, and then a move three with the bottom of Dirt Tornado. One, two, three. And that's the end of the round. All right. Running low on longevity, no doubt about that. Uh, so we're going to long rest on the Diviner. Uh, so we do have our jumpy move, right? Which helps us traverse this terrain more easily. One, two, three, four, five, six. We can't even make it into the other room this turn. So better to keep like this plus this. So we'll just play this. That's kind of our throwaway this turn. And we'll definitely long rest here. Gets our boots back, heals us for two, gives us more longevity. So why not? All right. So here we go. So we do a move four jump. No reason to use the boots now. I mean, whether we use them this turn or later, it doesn't gain us anything to use them now. And then using them next turn gives us more flex, more ability to adapt to when we find new information. And then we do nothing there with the top of first edge. And they both take their long rests. So if we teleport four, we can actually make a disarm trap somewhere that can theoretically do something. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of a why not, I suppose. Oh no, we have to lose one of these. So it has to be the disarm trap. So we actually can go forward and use protective aura. Okay. No. No, we kept this. We have to lose one of these two cards. Well, we still can do this. Let's see. Protective Aura from here is very likely to be effective. The Disarm Trap is less likely to be effective. I think I'd rather use Protective Aura. Plus, it gives me an experience. Not nothing. We do want to gain levels on this class. All right. So... We're down to seven cards now. Oh yeah, Avalanche, pretty easily. We don't have backup ammo either, so our Piercing Bow's not even gonna be insane. We still have Heaving Swing, Dirt Tornado though. Okay, uh, so anyway, we play these two cards. I guess we go later because we'd rather let her set up the aura first in case the things go before 13, I suppose. It doesn't matter if she gets hit because she's exhausting no matter what. I guess it would defeat her battle goal, but me. And so for us, I wish we had another move four. We've got a move three plus boots. Yeah, I mean, that can get us in pretty far. I mean, it makes sense definitely to lead with massive boulder really late with the move. Ah, oh, but this is what we want to use afterwards. So we kind of can only do a move two, but I guess move two plus boots is kind of okay. Mostly just playing this. Actually, I should lose. Yeah, I'd actually rather have Avalanche. There's a chance I use this loss in the last room. There's no chance I use Nature's Lift in the last room. Well, I guess there is. I can never play a loss in here. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we like have to run away and do a little bit of healing. Who knows? Now there, there's a better chance of that. So, All right. anyway, for now though, we're playing this. Let's do it. So Diviner's up first. We do a Teleport 4. Two, 4 to here. And then we use the top of Protective Aura, gain 1 experience, and create light, giving Shield 2. All right, now the Mind Thief is up. We're going to do a move 4 with Gnawing Horde. 1, 2, 3 to there. So we have one move left for now. goes here, this goes here, uh, the traps, so yeah, they were the top room traps, so we don't need those, nor that, oh, I was a little bit wrong as well, I thought the chest was there, but it was actually there, it's right about the coin lines though, oh, the might be this salivating right now, scoundrel pops in, and he's like, toasty, all right, so we have 
one elite living spirit, two regular living spirit, two regular corpses. It's a lot of damage we have to deal. But it is doable. We can win this scenario still. Even just two players in the last room of a three player scenario. We are the fun squad. This thing is the biggest problem, that elite living spirit. All right, what are they all up to? Please not the cursey thing. Okay, that's fine. Yes, yeah, so only three range on you even. Yeah, so you don't even reach. All right, that's, that's great actually. That was really nice to see. Minus one move, so you're not doing much either. Okay. So, definitely don't want to move in. Oh, interesting. So we need to use Massive Boulder hitting this, splashing onto this, because the one damage there is so important, actually, to make it so that a dirt, uh, like a three damage Dirt Tornado with Piercing Bow can actually kill this. So we do need to move back, actually, because since we played our, um, I mean, a move two, we only have move four max. So we have to get the, we have to have the door for the Cryguard to attack. We go after the corpse, though. Oh, but we'll, we'll mobilize the corpse. It's fine. Yep. So we're actually going to move back one with our last movement with the Mind Thief. No need to use the boots. Then we're going to use the top of Hostile Takeover. Gaining one experience. God, this class and experience. Creating ice and making an attack to range four mobilize, targeting living corpse number six. All right. Well, it's better here than later when we're attacking the spirits, I suppose. So that gets immobilized. All right. Then the living spirits go. Three range for the elite, two range for the others. They hit nothing. Living corpses go. They have minus one movement, so one. This one goes to here. This one does not move because it is immobilized. And then the crack heart goes. We're going to use the bottom of nature's lift as a move two. Plus our boots of striding as a move four. One, two, three, four to there. We're going to use massive boulder as an attack three, range three, targeting living corpse number six. We create earth. And we hit that corpse. Nice. Although, again, would... Prefer to see that later, but we'll take it now. So six there, or one, four there, putting it down to six, and one in each of these, which is a really big deal. Ah, the annoying thing is we can never hit all of them right now with the piercing bow thing. Oh, we have the earth set up. Oh well. Um, short rest here, leave that up. We can get another an extra turn later, no matter what. Otherwise we can bring, yeah, no, no, no. We can bring the mind's weakness back here, and then we'll have three turns now. I would play the mind's weakness now. No, I, I think tempo right now is more important. No, I'm going to reroll for that. That's just my highest damage attack. It's really important. From one best card into the other, right? But still, Frigid Apparition is the card we couldn't lose. I guess that's another big reason for not bringing mind's weakness back, is it would have been much, much. I mean, like, basically, wouldn't have been able to reroll on Frigid. Okay, well, also, we're going to take a long rest, since we're exhausting this turn no matter what. All right, so what's really annoying, like I said, is that we, we want to use Dirt Tornado here. I mean, I guess we're using Dirt Tornado Heaving Swing no matter what here. Maybe just not using the Piercing Bow yet. Because this still will hit these two for some damage, and like I mean, maybe not deal any damage to this, but at least muddle it. It's not bad. And going late doesn't really matter too much. We're likely to go before these anyway, and... I mean, we're most likely going before them. I guess that's really the the best point to be made. So we have ice, so we can move and stun something. One, two, three, four. The move four jump, we can make it basically anywhere. So it definitely makes sense to use that and to use this. This way we go before when they can possibly... Oh, they've already used the stun, but... I mean, this this initiative works fine. Um, I don't... If I use Hostile Takeover, I can't... Like, I either don't get the good move or the good attack, and I want both of these. And then next turn, I can go... I'm planning on going in and going invis. And then next turn, I can go late with that out of my invis. We just, I mean, we just got to dump everything at this point. All right, that works. This works. I mean, it's a little bit unfortunate, but it's, I think, also okay, because now they're going to clump up. Oh, we're going to be muddled. Oh, yeah, it'll, ha well, it'll have to wait. It'll have to wait. All right, so the elite already has range to attack us, so it makes an attack for three. Let's not forget that there are four curses in that deck that have been hiding in there for most of the scenario. All of the scenario. I mean, two for most of the scenario. Uh, we forgot to heal two when we did our long rest, because we should be at full. We didn't take any damage since long resting and we were at 10 we healed too full with the long rest just forgot so we take i was even thinking we're fine here because we're at full health 
Um, so this is three damage, and you already got the muddle. So then this one needs to move to here, and this one needs to move to here, and then they can all attack. So, well, we got a better clump, but the muddle is actually really annoying. Okay, well, there's one of those curses, and one damage there. That's fine. Okay. So, like, if I weren't muddled, I would actually probably use the piercing bow here on this attack, just to hopefully kill these. But the muddle just makes it so much worse, because we still got, what, I think one curse in our deck, but so many, so many bad outcomes. Yeah, well, I've only got one minus one still. Hmm. We've actually got mostly zeros. That's an interesting choice. But for now, it's the Mind Thief in the driver's seat. So we do want to leave the treasure chest for the Kragheart, I guess. I'm not even sure. Hold on, what are the corpses doing? So they're moving two. So normally this one would come up and hit us. Hit the Kragheart. If we go here... We can actually stun it so that it doesn't. It kind of sucks that I'm going to hit this with a giant attack when I really need to hit these. Or this, more than anything. But this hitting me is not insignificant either. Unfortunately, I just can't block it. I could not use Heating Swing Bottom here, and I could just move back one. I think that's fine since we're muddled anyway. Then I don't have to hit this. With my attack, I can actually attack this, or this even. I mean, no, more like this. Hmm, this is really difficult. God, I'm out of tea. I drank a little bit too much tea with my when my thumbs are chattering here. Um, hmm. <laughs> it's probably better to just stun this one, and not have to move back. It adds. But it adds like one damage here and here, although not really one damage here. It adds one damage here and gives us a chance. Of, but we have to get plus ones, which is so actually unlikely. So no, that doesn't actually change much. It just changes a little damage here. So no, let's not do that. We'll just move back and use Heating Swing. Um, so we could go here to get the chest. But I, there's still somewhat of a chance that the Kragar uh, can make it to the chest, I suppose. In which case, I'd like to leave it for the Kragar, since that is his... Battle goal. Check marks are not bad still. I mean, we don't need that many check marks, but I definitely love still to get, you know, a couple more. Even if it is one of the worst modifier decks in the game. Maybe the worst. Uh, I think maybe the Tinkers is worse. Because, yeah, the Tinkers doesn't remove plus zeros. Oof. Oof. All right. So when we do a move four jump, no matter what. One, two. If we go here, maybe if we hit and kill this, then... We can actually hit all these. Does muddling this really change much? No, not really. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, using our boots of striding. Popping our invis cloak. We're gonna attack the elite. The elite is really important to hit. Gotta believe in our deck. Do we believe in our deck? I guess that's a better question right now. Not so much, huh? Heart of the cards. So we're gonna use the top of Frigid Apparition. Consuming Ice, gaining one experience, making an attack five stun, targeting the elite. It's also just best to stun the elite. Oh, man. Oh, so very punished. What happened to Heart of the Cards? All right. Yeah, that's, that is really brutal. We're already struggling to beat this scenario with the plus three. The last thing we needed was something like that. All right, let's use the top of Dirt Tornado. We're going to consume Earth, gain one experience. Gives us an attack to muddle, one, two, um, expand like this. This is stun, better to muddle these. All right, this actually matters a fair amount, and I'm terrible at making these decisions. Can someone in chat please give me an ordering? I'm hitting all four of these with attack to muddles. Here, it basically doesn't matter at all. It basically just matters for these. So I've got Living Spirit 1, Living Spirit 4, Corpse 1, Corpse 6. All are getting attacked with attack to muddle while being disadvantaged. Then I'm going to just step one back so that the corpses don't hit me. If anyone wants to hand that over, I'm going to grab some water quickly while I wait for a suggestion, because this is way too important for me to choose myself. There's actually a chance. I mean, again, not important here, but the damage here actually matters a lot. And there's a curse and a miss in our deck, which I'd much rather see here than here. Be right back.
Thank you very much, Bye Canary. So, Spirit 4, Corpse 1, Corpse 6, Spirit 1 is our order. Alright. So this is for Spirit 4. So we'd like to see our curse here, basically. Or 2 plus 1s. Alright, perfect. Doing well so far. So then Corpse 1. Alright, nice. That's what I like to see. So Corpse 1 takes 2. Up to 8. Then we have Corpse 6. Nice. Oh my god, if the curse is on the last one, I'm going to... I don't know. Digitally kiss you. Well, that was still the best possible ordering. Well played, by Canary. And see, this is why... Because you see, there, there was a correct and incorrect ordering there. And you found the correct one, and I would have done it incorrectly. Because it's just my nature. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That actually did make a difference. Again, there was... The ordering here had, so we got two and two, and we could have gotten, the outcomes possible were a miss, a minus one, a plus zero, and a plus zero. And we got the two plus zeros here, and the miss and the minus one here and here, where we were doing a two attack on something with three shield. So the different, like, the possible scale was a, a six damage swing, essentially. No, a, th a three damage swing. I mean, we could have had three less damage or three more damage here, and we ended up having three more damage. All right. Then we use the bottom of heaving swing. Speaking of swings. Uh... No, we've already used our boots, right? Yes, we have. So we're just going to take one step back to here using, with the bottom of heaving swing as default move two. All right, corpses are up. One, two, one, two. Fair enough. I'll have to try to remember that in the future. I'll take anything I can get at this point. All right, so Diviner heals, and she's out. So my Thief is going late and just doing a default attack on something. I think we'll play these two cards no matter what. We'll see. Probably just doing crater attack and then moving. I guess that's almost always what we're doing here. If they don't move, maybe we get to heal ourselves at the bottom then. I think it's always better to move though because it prevents these things from attacking us as well. I don't know. No, but we need. This is also our best initiative. Yeah, that's why this is the best set of two cards. All right, eliminated. Here goes. Ooh, they're going after the mind thief. That's annoying, but they only have one movement, so it's not that big of a deal. All right, so we go first. We're making attack three, range three with Crater. Uh, we'll target number six, because if we get a plus one, this one's dead. So why not? Mm, come on, that was our last curse in the deck. <sighs> come on, these draws. Ugh. All right, so they have minus one move, minus one range. That so means two and two. So if we go to here, we do still get hit. All right, so we got to keep keep falling back. So we're gonna use rumbling advance. And we're gonna move to here. We're gonna create use the actual bottom because it creates earth. Not that we're sure to need it. I know the diviner is shaking head disapprovingly, but sadly we lost the diviner early to to an unfortunate crit. This is why I love having the diviner. All right, living spirits are up. Oh, they're healing them. Oh no, they haven't taken damage. Okay, okay. it's only this one that has. So let's see. They have. Again, two movements, so one, two to there. And then two range is one, two to there. This one can only move one. And they lose this and this, and this loses this. Yep. Okay. Then it is the Mind Thief's turn. I guess the annoying thing now is that we... Well, we need to move down here and, I guess, attack one of these... Basically because we can't move an attack on a corpse because the corpses are going to go after us. And attacking this sucks because we're making an attack four into something with four health. Rather just let the piercing bow take care of this one. We could also summon, but that's just crazy. Uh, so we're going to use the bottom of Gnawing Horde as a move four. One, two, three, four. I don't think it changes much in which one of these spots we're in, to be honest. It might, but not that I can think of. This allows us to attack either one without moving, which uh, well, I guess we don't have Perverse Edge anymore, or nor Invis, so there's not much to be gained either way. And then we're going to use the top of Hostile Takeover, simply as a default attack four, targeting, I suppose, I guess, well, we probably want a massive boulder here always, so again, shouldn't really change anything, but we'll target number one. Come on. Jeez. Oh, I'm just not dealing damage. I'm... <laughs> 
These level four enemies are brutal. The difference. Oh wait, they only have two shield. Oh no, no, no. It's because yeah, yeah. The difference between two shield and three shield is so much when you're level one or level two. Like with our modifier decks that have so many bad cards and they have three shield. Like I'm just keep swinging and missing. Oh god, it's awful. All right, the corpses go. Um, this one can't move at all because they have minus one movement. This one moves one. That's a little bit unfortunate. Makes our splash a bit worse. God. All right. So now, I mean, I'm going to keep Mind's Weakness up. I don't think I can afford to bring it back. I'm just going to use Endurance Potion. All right. Hostile Takeover is fine to lose. I guess we don't have good initiatives anymore. I don't know what I have to do. So play this, and I guess play the better move. And probably, I mean, well, I guess it doesn't matter because we have to Endurance Potion back the better move no matter what. I don't think we win. I think we just got too many bed flips here at the end. I think we had a chance, but... All right, short rest for sure. <laughs> Pay one life. If it's Dirt Tornado now, Heaving Swing is also kind of bad because it gives us two direct damage against a single target. Kind of have to get hit by one of the corpses. We also can't afford to get hit. <sighs> Massive Boulder kind of sucks from here, though, because we really want to hit this to do one splash to each of these. That's so much better. I have to save the Piercing Bow, I think, for the Elite. Also, I do have Earth. <sighs> we just go Heaving Swing and hope for the best. I mean, Heaving Swing, Dirt Tornado, and hope for the best. Yeah, maybe that's just what we have to do at this point. Oh, no, we lost... <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Uh, so in that case, I think we just do this and this. And again, hope for the best. Um, we're just going to use massive, I mean, Dirt Tornado at this point, And we're going to use it with... All right, so we want to make sure the Mind Thief goes before. He does. She does. And we're going to use it with the Piercing Bow. Just hope to basically kill these two Living Spirits, which essentially have to die here. And how we're going to kill this is we're just going to kind of have to get lucky, especially because we don't have Piercing... I mean, Heaving Swing anymore. But... We're not making <clears throat> any progress on killing these with a Mind Thief. We've just attacked twice on Living Spirits with attack fives on the Mind Thief and done zero damage, which is like, costing us a lot. I think this is kind of our like desperation play here, but we don't really have too much choice in the matter. Okay. Well, the course is not attacking is quite good for us. So Mind Thief is up first. We're going to use the top of Frigid Apparition as an attack five. Um, I guess it makes more sense to attack the back one. I don't really know that changes much, but sure. We'll attack number four this time. Okay. So our five is actually six. So that might change what we're going to do in the end here. Because now we actually do one-shot that Living Spirit, which is really good. All right. So we got a chance again. Um, so we have to use Feedback Loop as default move two. God, our initiative is going to suck next turn too. I mean, we're not in Viz. So default move two with Feedback Loop. I don't want to be in the AoE here. So we'll just move to there, I guess. From there, we can still move and attack anything. Just draws us further apart to make their multi-target worse. Although it can actually, as it turns out, still hit us with multi-target. Do we have? No, we don't have boots of striding. And we have to endurance potion it. All right, we're up on the Craghart now. So it's not worth using the Piercing Bow at this point, because we only hit one Living Spirit. So we're going to use Dirt Tornado. I mean, we could actually just heal. I don't think that's better, though. We're going to use Dirt Tornado top, of Consuming Earth, gaining one experience. We do an attack two, Muddle, targeting all these. All right. Uh, so the most important targets, I guess, are either of these. So it doesn't really change much. I guess we'll do... I won't I won't try to use your powers for evil all the time by Canary. So we'll do Spirit 1, Corpse 1, Corpse 6. So these are all attack two, Muddles. <laughs> This is insane. I mean, this was actually the best target for that to happen on, but still, this is insane at this point. All right. Jeez. So three damage here, down to five, and then four damage here, which actually kills this, although would have been fine not to because it was taking one damage on its turn no matter what. Oh, no, this actually does work out well, yes, because then we can use the bottom of Rumbling Advance, creating Earth, and move to here. Gives us this coin, and more significantly, does one direct damage to this Living Spirit. All right, their attacks are going to hurt this turn, that's for sure. This one's muddled. Uh, this is also muddled, that doesn't really matter. 
Okay, Living Spirits go. So the Elite can hit both of us. Mind Thief first and then Krykart. We really need to see some of those curses now. So the tech three on the Mind Thief. All right, great. Then on the Krykart. All right, well, have to go somewhere. <sighs> okay, we've got a chance. So then the regular attacks first the Krykart and then the Mind Thief. Krykart first is disadvantaged. Okay, so no damage. It's minus one and minus two. Then on the Mind Thief. We've got a helmet. We've got a... Oh, my God, these helmets. I swear. So two damage to the Mind Thief. Okay, we're both at four. <sighs> All right. That's gone. Corpse moves to here. Takes one damage down to four. Oh, yeah, you're right. It was muddled on the Mind Thief. Good call. Oh, thank you. I... I I was thinking that I disadvantaged on the cracker because I was adjacent, but no, it was because of the muddle. That, that's a very good call to actually save the Mind Thief 2 health. Thank you very much. Good catch. All right. So at this point, it's a massive boulder hitting this, splashing onto this, I suppose. And... Oh, wait, we actually have... We have Earth. So this is one damage and then two damage. One damage here. <laughs> Makes it so the Mind Thief should be able to kill that. And then two damage here. Puts this to one. That doesn't change so much, unfortunately. But then if we make it disadvantage. The problem is when the initiative is. We really, I mean, we got to do this. We have to play this initiative. Because Crater is actually so good here as a loss. We can even just go from one side to the other to just basically kill both of these and leave this for our piercing bow. That actually makes the most sense. All right. We need them to go after us. This is really important. All right. They're not attacking. That's also good. The curse is here. Is more okay? <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. So we go first. We're going to use the bottom of crater. We're going to consume earth, gain one experience, gain two experience, in fact. So all adjacent allies and enemies suffer one damage. So oh, this was actually interesting. Hmm. Well, I think it doesn't change much about what we do here. Uh, then we do a move for jump, go to here, then because we consumed earth, all adjacent allies and enemies suffer two damage. So this dies, and this takes two, going down to one. All right, it's so important that we get a minus one or higher here on this attack. This is lost, then we use the top of earth and clod as a default attack two, targeting corpse number one. Just need a minus one, just need a minus one, just need a minus one. Okay, that'll do. That's fine. <sighs> All right. Yeah, this is kind of kind of cruel. Uh, we can have it go here, here. It doesn't really change much for us. I guess here we can be next to the chest and attack it, but we actually don't want it to be next to us when we make it to the chest. All right, and so we each get a curse. Uh, not over yet. All right, so then the Mind Thief goes. So, this is kind of unfortunate because we have the decision of whether we should try to play, like, no, nah, I mean, we've got to attack it. What is the worst outcome for us? It has four shield, so even a crit on a four, no, a crit on a four does kill it. A plus two on a four does two damage, a plus one on a four does one damage. Yeah, both these things are good for us. So, basically, just a crit is bad for us because it would end it and we wouldn't get the chest. I mean, although we still kind of just want to win, but still. Uh, so we're going to use, I mean, one of these is a move four. It doesn't really matter. We're going to move to here. I'm getting a coin. And then we're going to use the other as a default attack two, which is really four because of mine's weakness. Okay. Well, no damage, but at least we tried. I think corpse has been eliminated. Yeah, that was actually us there. Okay. Um, so we do still have our biggest attack, right? Yeah, it doesn't change anything whether we bring back Mind's Weakness this turn. We can bring it back next turn, but short rest. Just need to keep that card exactly. Right. So unfortunately, I oh know we do have a move three. Yeah, we're going to, I think we need to short rest one turn early. Because we need to, we want to attack it with this using Piercing Bow, in which case a plus zero kills it. But we also need to make sure we have enough movement to make it to the chest, and currently we don't. Because we can't attack with this, and it has to be a ranged attack. 
Alright. So we just can't lose Dirt Tornado? Alright, that's fine. I mean, we're taking some risks here, but we're trying to have it all. I'm going to go really late, which is unfortunate. But it is what it is. Maybe the Mind Thief just kills it for us. Who knows? Okay, here goes. That's what we do not want to see. All right, Mind Thief's up first. We're going to begin by making an attack five with Frigid Apparition. Whew! We did it! We did it! Oh, okay, that'll do. So five plus two is seven. This thing has three health and four shield, so we do kill it. Oh, we did it. We got to have it all. All right, and then we use the bottom of Gnawing Horde. We move on to a coin. Yeah, we left a ton of coins behind. Yeah, the Diviner exhausted somewhere. Well, actually, back there, but whatever. All worth it. So then we can use either of these as enough movement to make it to the chest, which gets our battle goal. So we actually all completed our battle goals, and we successfully completed the scenario on plus three, which is not a given. So it is chest number 50. Whew. That was fun. That was fun. The game is at its best when it's like this. Oh, we gain an item. All right, we're about to spoil item number 101, Fair Warning. It's actually a pretty good item for us. We can't actually... Yeah, yeah, this is actually... I'll definitely use this. I mean, since it's free, for sure. All right, so again, let me just double check. It was item 101, because that's an item I certainly want. Yep, nice. All right. So we gain item 101, second skin, which is pretty great. It's the Krakert picked it up, and actually the Krakert's the one we want to have it anyway. And I think for now we'll use it. It's possible later we might swap it out for something else. Um, but for now, definitely excellent. So we remove two minus ones from our attack modifier deck. Uh, let's get those out of there then, as well as... Uh, so there was actually... The remaining curse was... Oh, no, no, because they each get cursed one more time. Yeah, so there should be two curses in here, right? Yep. Yeah, this was the first scenario we've played where the Diviner has felt disappointing. But again, I think... Well... Hmm. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, maybe it's plus three difficulty. I think more likely. We just got... I mean, it, it's kind of unfair to... We got a really unlucky crit. Although even a plus one, I guess it was kind of just bad strategy there. We put the Diviner in a really stupid spot. More than anything. Uh, so, we unlock... Gloomhaven Warehouse, Scenario 8. But, I mean, it did feel like we just needed more damage, which she didn't have. We also, I mean, we got unlucky in numerous regards. We also lost the her best damage, I mean, her best attack as her first short rest. And couldn't really reroll. We'll see if plus 3 difficulty continues to be a struggle for her, because we need damage so much more. At the same time, her multi-disarm is so much better now, even, with enemies doing so much damage. So I think she's still going to be excellent. Again, I think it was just... We were we had a greater sense of urgency because we lost one of our party members kind of early because of the two, two cards lost. But again, this just kind of reinforces to me um, the significance of never being able to play early losses on this class. All right. So we gain five gold each. We gain some was it, like dark plans. Dark Bounty, Jixera's Plans. There we go. Alright. We gain five gold each. Let's see how much other gold we gain. So here, it was four, but really three. So gold is just, coins are still just worth three. So here, we had 12. So 17 total. Putting us up to a solid 50. That's a, already an enhancement. And we were at 7 health at the end, so we did gain our check mark. And for experience, we gained 8, plus here it is going to be 10. So we gained 18 experience. Not bad. Well on our way.
Okay, so here we gain 6 plus the 5, so 11 gold, putting us back up to 25. We gain a check mark, and for experience, we gained 19. How am I liking the current party comp? I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I mean, you know, uh, low level Crycart struggles a bit. You really want Rock Slide that unlocks this class, so. I mean, I, I feel like the party comp is already pretty decent at level 1 and is, like, just going to scale up like kind of crazy well. Once we get Rock Slide, it's a huge difference for us. Um, this was Again, this is the first scenario we really struggled. We are playing on plus three. I think any party that can, I mean, anytime you can play on plus three and still win, even if you struggle, uh, your party comp is certainly not bad. Thus far, my experience with the Diviner has been overwhelmingly positive, I would say. Uh, not sure if you know this, but you can right-click on counter buttons on XP Gold to go and down. Uh, yeah, so... Actually, you can on this one, but not on this one. So I kind of just in the habit of not doing it. Technically, I could do it on this one, but so look, this is a left click. Or let's just write 25 so we don't forget. This is a left click, uh, and this is a right click. Unfortunately, this mod doesn't support that, which is a shame. Again, there there are certainly quality of life improvements available in the other mod that this mod doesn't have. Definitely, if they could just change a couple small things, I would be there with open arms. All right, um, so over here we gained 15, 18, 21, so 26 gold. Not bad. Oh, we are ready to do some enhancements. So we need Prosperity 2, and we need to unlock enhancements. So just to be clear, we've already got 80 gold of enhancements mapped out, which is pretty nice. Also, Antares. Like, having the Mind Thief, who can so easily in strengthen self alongside the Diviner with the deck manipulation, that's going to be so nice, right? This stupid enhancement. Come on. So that that's definitely another synergy that I'm quite happy with. In fact, with the Diviner, I wonder if this isn't even a more, like, a better enhancement to do than uh, doing the plus one range. Because it's true that, like, when you have the Diviner in your party, Strengthen actually gets better, which is a bit scary, because Strengthen is already... Scarily good. All right, so we gained 26 experience here. Just mind thief things. We're actually leveling up. No, not quite. Uh, 91. All right, and we also gained a check mark. Uh, wasn't a boss scenario. Didn't kill any vermlings. And we're never donating. All right. Whew. That was fun. That was a fun one to end on. I'm going to look forward to continuing on, uh, on plus three. We do need to do scenario five. Scenario 5 sucks, right? Like, oops, we actually checked the wrong one. Scenario 5 is one of those extremely high variance scenarios based off of what cultists flip in the first room. So this is the only reason that I was hesitant. I, like, I didn't want to do this on plus 3 because I could just, like, here, you know, we, we struggled a lot, but it felt satisfying because it wasn't just based on, I mean, again, it was kind of based on some flips, but the flips, the flips more or less average out, but adding the additional form of variance in summoning to playing high difficulty is just really frustrating. Just like, makes the, the disgusting ability card flips of summoners more annoying. But I don't know, maybe we'll try it. I, I mean, we don't have a lot of choice. It's not like we're about to go do eight. Yeah, I mean, we're going to do five next time on Thursday, so... Well... Maybe we just do it on plus two. I also don't want to stagnate at low level too much, because I'd like to be leveling to get through the Diviner Guide as quickly as possible. Yeah, they are early, but they're still in the back of a room with night demons in the front. So it's still the same issue. You can't, like, you don't have the freedom to just go CC them. Oh, because you're saying you could reset? Yeah, but I never let myself reset, you know? Although that is a fair point. I think, if anything, I'll probably just end up doing it on plus two. Like I said, this campaign is, is for fun and for challenge, but it's also to be able to write a... I mean, it is important to me to write a guide for the Diviner. I'd really like to do that. And I don't think just like repeating the same scenario over and over again because I'm trying it on plus three and getting unlucky is really the way to go. I'll probably do that one on plus two and then whatever follows on plus three on next Thursday. Yeah. Anyway, uh, all right. So that's it for today. Thank you very much for everyone who tuned in. It was a pleasure as usual. I'll be back on Monday, most likely for, I guess I can't confirm yet because I don't know, maybe Marcel wants to do. Although I guess they're doing that testing now. So in the first room yeah yeah that that's exactly what i thought right 
when I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't think that I would need to, but I actually should have realized that. I, I mean, I, I should have absolutely um, cloaked in the first room. It, it was absolutely a mistake. I, I thought about it at first. I was like, oh, if I just cloaked. I mean, again, if I get plus zero or lower, I didn't need to cloak, but honestly, the cloak doesn't do that much for her, like compared to the Mind Thief, where it does a lot that I should be less conservative with it. This was a mistake. Sorry, uh, what I was going to say is I wasn't sure if you wanted to do the higher level testing still on Monday, um, if that would be possible for you during streaming time. I mean, on stream, I guess, or I mean, because I know you asked today, I, I wasn't sure if you meant like off stream testing or on stream testing, I guess was my first question. Because then if if you did want to do it on stream, I can't do it on Monday. That's the easiest day for me. Otherwise, I can maybe shuffle like Monday and Tuesday around. I could do it on, off works too. Yeah, off is a little bit more difficult for me. The I mean, the only time I can really do off is on the weekends, because otherwise on the week, you know, I mean, during the week, I've kind of committed to streaming on these three days. And then the other days I don't like I'm not free at e in the evening after work. Um, well, anyway, we, we can figure it out. Sure. Sounds good. All right. Well, anyway, I'll be back on Monday with something. Um, I guess you won't really know, but you're welcome to tune in on, at the beginning of Monday and I'll provide a warning to make sure you don't get spoiled for anything you don't want to see. Uh, Tuesday, presumably will be custom class testing. And then if you want to be here for the low prosperity can diviner campaign, this will 100% be on Thursday. So if you tune in next Thursday, you'll get to continue seeing this campaign. Uh, all right, yeah, I look forward to seeing the custom class video sent. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a great weekend, and hope to see some of you again soon next week. Take care.